before we go on board. <laughs> you want me that's to say for something tonight? Uh, something. Yeah, I think that's that's easier with um with a with a beverage in hand for me. <laughs> I I appreciate that. Okay, we'll get started, guys. Um, all right, uh, Dave, you don't need anything from me further. All good to go. Okay, we're good to go. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Okay, good morning. Um, just a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded, um, working off from a, a virtual platform still, so I'll take a roll call vote. It is a special day. We are a full commission for our first official public meeting of five. There she goes, of five today. Um, it is also a, a critically special meeting because we are welcoming new commissioner, Akisha Skinner, a friend of ours, a long time respected colleague of ours who were delighted with the treasurer's appointment for her arrival. At the same time today will be Commissioner Cameron's, our longstanding historic tenure um, uh, year termed uh, commissioner's uh, last day. But we will, right for this moment, celebrate the fact that we are five um, and making our decisions and, uh, today with all of the team as a full commission. So I'll take our roll call. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am here. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Commissioner Hill. Good morning, and I am present. Commissioner Skinner. I'm here. Good morning, everyone. Great, thank you so much. All right, um, uh, before we get started, I wanna give a huge thank you to Commissioner O'Brien as our secretary. Uh, she's navigated uh, getting with, of course, legal and, and Councilor Grossman's good work, um, a slew of minutes done in order to ensure Commissioner Cameron's um, uh, vote and insights on them. So you have the floor, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the legal team, Todd and Carrie in particular, for helping us catch up on this. Uh, you'll notice there are five packages of minutes in the packet today, and fortunately for Commissioner Hill and Commissioner Skinner, they don't need to pour over them and give us feedback. Um, these were minutes that were for meetings prior to their arrival, where the three of us, Chair Judd Stein, Commissioner Cameron, and myself, make up the quorum. Um, one of them is actually, um, we do not have a quorum on today, the August 19th. I was not there and Commissioner Zuniga, who would have been the quorum, he, he departed faster than we thought for his position at post. And so there was not a meeting to get those done prior to his departure, but they are there for any comments that may need to be made in terms of the draft so that they're accurate to your memory. But starting with uh, the oldest, May 26th of 2021, I would move we approve those minutes subject to any necessary changes for typographical errors or other non-material matters. Uh, any any questions or edit? I'm oh, sorry, go. Did you second? I, I was going to second and I did not have any edits on that one, uh, but thank you for asking, but I do second. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I was a little bit out of sync there. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's just the three of us, unless um, Commissioner Hill or Commissioner Skin have, Skinner have any uh, questions around these? Okay. Is that correct, um, Protocol Commissioner O'Brien? Just uh, the three could, of us. Could, certainly, or they could just vote to abstain and, then, and they want to make that, if they wanted to make that clear in the record before we go seriatim, that's fine too. Okay, excellent. Then Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Abstain. And Commissioner Skinner. Abstain. And I vote yes, thank you. And moving on to the next chronologically would be July 15th of 2021. And I would again move that we approve those minutes subject to any necessary changes for typographical errors or other non-material matters. Second. Any concerns or edits, Commissioner Cameron? Okay. Excellent. I'm all set as well. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Hill? Abstain. Commissioner Skinner? Abstain. I vote yes. We have zero to abstentions. Thank you. 
And moving on to July 29th of 2021, I would move that we approve those minutes again, subject to any needed changes for typographical errors or other non-material matters. Second. No edits or comments? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Abstain. Commissioner Skinner. Abstain. And I vote yes. Thank you. Three zero two abstentions. And now in terms of August 19th, 2021, I don't know if you, Madam Chair or Commissioner Cameron, want to make any corrections to those that. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, I did read them, but I, I did not have corrections. And I and I feel the same. We missed you at that meeting. <laughs> That's what kids can do to you when they have no camp or school. Um, and lastly, moving on to August 26th of 2021. It's the last in the packet for today. I would move that we approve those minutes, also subject to any needed changes for typographical errors or other non-material matters. Second. Any edits or comments on this last package? I'm just taking one last note. Sorry. Well set. Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Abstain. Commissioner Skinner. Abstain. And I vote yes, three zero, two abstentions. Thank you, excellent work. Uh, uh, I and truly thank you um, for really pressing on this exercise. It's a really important part of our record. We're fortunate that our record is also recorded, but minutes give um, will fulfill an, uh, a compliance obligation and most importantly, an important record for us to reflect on as we do our work on a weekly basis. And you know, then we have a chance to look back at our minutes and it reminds us of our, of our work that we need to do ahead. So thank you, we're getting caught up. Mm -hmm. All right, um, then are there no other questions around minutes? All right, we'll move on, good morning. Executive Director Wells. Good morning. Good morning and a big welcome to Nikisha. Uh, welcome aboard, Commissioner Skinner. Uh, so the first item on the administrative update is the on-site casino updates. I'll turn that over to Assistant Director Van. Oh, you're muted, Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> you're on mute. Yeah. You'd, there we go. I'd get the hang of this by now. Yeah. Uh, there, there are no updates on the table game and, and slot side at this point, but there are some on the entertainment. Uh, for PPC, they start uh, live racing on April 11th. Uh, on April 23rd, they are uh, sponsoring uh, comedian Greg, Greg Fitzsimmons. Uh, on Friday and Saturday nights, they have live bands at uh, Revolution's Lounge. And on Saturday, May 7th, the Kentucky Derby, which will include uh, music and uh, race bettings. Uh, uh, Encore uh, continues uh, give it with their sport jacket giveaway, which has been very successful. Uh, and MGM uh, are sponsoring at TAPS, their first responders for local police and fire departments, uh, which includes free, free meals and bowlings at TAP restaurants. Uh, you have any questions, let me know. Questions or comments for Bruce? Bruce, we always like hearing these reports and I think we have agreed to institutionalize them. So thank you. Um, it's nice to see that the events and, um, are opening up. It's great. Thank you. Okay, Karen. Okay, the next item, we are also, aside from uh, Commissioner Cameron, we're also saying goodbye to Scott Helloway, who is a new position. We're very proud of him and we're proud of uh, the new position, but we're very sorry to see him go. He's been the Gaming Technical Compliance Manager at the MGC. And I'm going to turn it over to Katrina Jagger Gomes just to give him a little bit of a send off here because we will miss you, Scott. Okay, Katrina. Thanks, Karen. 
Uh, you know, Scott's been with us almost four years as the gaming technical compliance manager and worked side by side with me and very diligently opening MGM and the Encore Boston Harbor. And he has been so instrumental in so many things, including the recent uh, application for voluntary self-exclusion. Scott, in his spare time, which he had none, uh, was a huge uh advocate and um, a huge resource in helping develop that application, even though it wasn't within his wheelhouse. And this just really speaks to his teamwork and his collaboration and his work ethic. And we're just so extremely proud of him. And he's always been a consummate professional. And um, I know personally, I'm going to miss Scott a, a huge lot because he's been um, a great friend, but a great colleague. And we've grown together in the last four years. And he's taught me quite a bit. I was very new to gaming when I came into the commission. And Scott has taught me quite a bunch about EGDs and how it all works and the back end infrastructure. So Scott, I thank you so much for everything you've done. You're welcome. Thank, thank you very much for um, recognizing me here. So um, I will miss everybody here for sure. So, but, uh, yeah. Well, Scott, don't think you're gonna get away the, with this easily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I would be, so. <laughs> um, so I'll start with Commissioner Skinner. You had the opportunity to work with, with Scott as a colleague and now as a, as a commissioner. And then I'll move to Commissioner Hill, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Cameron. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Scott. We, we, we worked together for a very brief time. Um, but one thing that I um, come to appreciate is your smile and your ability um, to just brighten up the room with it. And so that for sure, I will miss. Um, Katrina and her team, um, you know, will suffer greatly, I think, without you, <laughs> without you down the hall. Um, but I wish you the best in your new endeavor and um, don't be a stranger. Thank you very much. Commissioner Hill. Scott was one of the uh, very first people that I met when I came on board six months ago. And uh, when Nikisha talks about his smile, uh, that is an understatement, Nikisha. Um, his smile, his laugh, his personality uh, was something that I was drawn to very early on. And not only has he been a great colleague and a great help whenever I've had IT issues, Katrina, um, he's been awesome as has the whole staff. But more importantly, uh, the conversations that we've had on the on the side on personal issues. Um, you're going to be very, very missed by me. I can tell you that. And I wish you the very, very best in your next endeavor. And I do hope that you check in with us every now and again, uh, because that would be appreciated by all. But uh, congratulations on your new job. And more importantly, thank you for a job well done here at the Gaming Commission. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bryan. Thank you, Scott. Congratulations. Um, I was happy for you, but sad to hear that you were leaving. Um, I think it speaks not only to your ability to, you know, your personality to fit in right away, but it was really not until I read Katrina's nice email summarizing your experience that I realized that you and I were here for about the same amount of time. And I thought you'd been here far longer than me. You knew what you were doing, very comfortable with everybody. Um, so you fooled me on that one. I thought you were here way longer than you were. And you, um, I think I can say from that, you made, definitely made an impact. Um, as Commissioner Hill said too, you know, the IT team has been great, everyone, you know, to, to a person. And you were definitely a part of that experience for me. So good luck. I hope you do stay in touch. Uh, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to come back and uh, sit in front of the commission uh, about uh, my, with my uh, next position. So yeah, hopefully look forward to that. Cameron? Scott, I want to wish you well. You know, I, I'm not surprised that you, you have this opportunity. I feel fortunate to have gotten to know you a little bit personally because we were up at MGM. We had to open that casino. We had work to do the night before and the next morning. So a bunch of us stayed overnight. And uh, first of all, I remember some IT crisis. So you were, you were like hard at it trying to solve some problems. So I saw you with your your uh, 
you know, your work hat on. And then luckily later at night after we had all finished, we went to some nice Mexican place and had a meal together. And we had a lot of fun. I remember you being, I mean, I learned a lot from you, but then you were just, just a lot of fun to spend time with. And it just always makes me think, wow, we, we have done such a great job hiring great people here at the commission. And, um, but when you hire great people, guess what? They'll have other opportunities. So I'm proud of you. And I thank you so much for the work you've done. And, um, you know, you'll be missed for sure, but keep in touch. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, Scott, I've had the chance to have a nice conversation with you. Selfishly, I took up way too much of your time. Um, and I've missed being at the office with you. Um, you know, everybody's touched on your warmth, which has really radiated throughout the office, and it made such an impression on all of us. Um, I um, so I <clears throat> I want to stress that 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 is a great asset. And I also have had just such respect for your work and your expertise. Um, Katrina's email did show the breadth of it. And so we are very thankful for you sharing all of that with us for these last several years. Um, I think what we really are saying is that we're gonna miss your character um, and all that you bring, both work-wise and as a human. So take that with you, and I know you will. You have a great opportunity ahead. Nothing pleases folks like me who have served in both public and private sectors to, to see um, a public servant like you really be able to leverage all that you've accomplished here for a new journey. And my suspicion is that you may circle back to public service at some point. Um, it, 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 um, it can be compelling and you may just want to come back and give back in another role way in the future. Until then, enjoy your new opportunity and if you want to share any of it with us, you are welcome back at any time. Great. So thank, thank you very you. much. I, I, you're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate all the very kind words. Yeah. And we're thinking of you and your family. Um, uh, Karen, um, do you want to close out for us? And it's just, just a big thank you to Scott. I'm glad I'm going to get to see you today. I know your next last day is next week, so we'll be seeing you. But yeah, just a big thank you from, from myself personally and, and from the staff, because you've really been just such a big help and such a wonderful presence. And, you know, we love you and we want you to do well. We're excited for your new position, but you will be missed. And I think you know that. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, next up uh, is an update on the Pace Setters program, uh, which is uh, basically a, a group of business leaders that are uh, committing to best practices and innovation on diversity spend. So I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Administrative Officer to the Chair and Special Projects Manager, Crystal Howard, just to give you a little more information about what the, the program is and uh, why we joined and the, and, the, um, and the role that we take in that program. I'll turn it over to Crystal. Thanks, Karen. It's really hard to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> Scott. I just want to add, um, I've known Scott, we've been here almost, I think he was here right at Brown when I came in. He's not only helpful, dedicated, and versatile, but he was really interested in people personally. And I admired that. He was probably one of the first people I talked to when I got here. So I'm also going to miss him. Um, I don't know if you're still here, Scott, but I've told you that. Uh, but on the level of pace setters, so I think we've talked about this a little bit briefly, but I'm just going to kind of give you a slight overview and then where we are as an agency. Uh, pace setters is a program of the uh, Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. They uh, define a pace setter as a large and mid-sized company and anchor institutions committed to using their procurement purchasing power to close the racial wealth gap by intentionally increasing spend with businesses of color. Uh, of course, we uh, have our own goals internally that this aligns with really well, but one in particularly would be the, um, within their vision statement is that uh, they want 10% of all business and government contracts to go to businesses of color in the Commonwealth within five years. So there's a, a natural tie there. And because of that, we did sign on to pay setters around August of 2021. Um, 
many of the businesses that are support organizations or program partners and a couple of the MBEs recognized by pace setters themselves were already involved with the program. And so um, we learned about it. Encore is actually a partner as well. So we had learned about it through that and it just seemed um, a natural extension of our own uh, intentions. Um, and actually I can quickly show you uh, the pace setters that there are currently. My screen just disappeared, so I hope you guys can see this over here. Um, here we are, Mass Gaming, and you can see a lot of really, uh, is it showing you the right screen? Okay. I've got three screens, as you know, so um, you can see there aren't a whole lot of state entities. We are one of the, I'd say, smaller institutions, and I think that says a lot about our commitment. Um, a few universities, UMass is one of the other state entities, and then, of course, Mass Development is one of the signatories. So uh, we're uh, among a few partners at this point, but it does continue to grow and um, we're learning a lot from some of these really big entities. So some of the basic guidelines and commitments as part of our um, partnership as a pace setter is um, to commit increasing spend with MBEs in the Commonwealth over the next five years of joining the program. And in order to do that, we provide data every year to measure, report, and increase spending and show that it's actually happening, but also just that that's part of our commitment. We attend quarterly meetings, and there are meetings that are for the PACE that are program manager, I think is how they call it, and then um, the C-suite um, level meetings as well, because intentionally they require C-suite and procurement level commitment to inclusion. So. Karen and uh, Derek attend those for us and have been really active. It's really great to see that uh, level of commitment for our agency. We also on a more definitive level must share at least one contract opportunity per quarter or calendar year. Um, and then we have to commit to a minimum of one new contract with an MBE every year for five years. Uh, and uh, so far we're uh, on track doing so. For this, both um, membership in both the chamber and the program are required. So we do have both memberships. And one of the big benefits is uh, we receive access to their trusted uh, and a, approved MBE referral list, uh, which is a collaboration of proven companies across the pace setter entities that exist. And so we get a lot of information from what other organizations have found successful. Uh, a good example of that was uh, that gave us a um, a more breadth to put out our consultant or vendor to perform our salary review process. And while that um, isn't exactly where we ended up, our contract actually came from a different recommendation from my grantee leaf, which we'll hear from later actually. So this ties in really well. But aside from those great introductions, we also received diversity training focused solely on um, supplier and vendor diversity, which is a lot different from what we usually hear. And in our last um, quarterly meeting we had, uh, we were able to take part in an hour long training focused on overcoming bias in vendor diversity specifically. That was uh, from the diversity at workplace consulting group. So they bring in external vendors. There are also other programs and uh, workshops that we can um, uh, attend and be part of if, if we have an example to show. I know um, the SEO did one in 2021. And so, uh, you know, that's really great, a partner that we already have as well. So they are showing up for the other pace setters. Uh, the biggest next step for us is we're coming toward the end of our first year. So we'll begin to prepare for the data collection and submission phase for our first round and uh, be able to participate in the annual pace setters reporting. That's where we're at right now. Back to you, Karen. Thank you. Any questions for Crystal? Commissioner Skinner, Commissioner Skinner maybe? I, 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 I wondered if you could just repeat the pay setter commitments again. Um, I think you, you said um, she, we, we have to share at least one um, opportunity per quarter. The definitive commitments, you know, alongside from participation and data are that we share one contract opportunity per quarter. So they ask um, at the beginning of every quarter if we have um, 
had success with an MBE internally, and it can be one we've always used, and or whether we, and when we say to them, hey, we're looking for this, and we would normally consider this, but if there are other opportunities um, or suggestions, we'd, we'd like that as well. So they kind of make a list of all the opportunities that the businesses have, because they do have and work on the other end of this with MBEs, um, local MBEs. And then the other commitment is that we commit to a minimum of one new contract with an MBE every year for five years. So we should be able to show growth of our MBE um, portfolio, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, over those five years, ideally having five more by the end, but perhaps more. Um, so is that an year's too? To do. I think, and I don't and think Crystal, I think. Crystal, I think I'm right. We will have at least done that already, right? So, yes. Uh, yeah. For this past year, so. Karen, correct? Yep. Over Excellent. the last year. Yep. Excellent. And, uh, you know, our external contracts do count for that. It's, it's just that we share that we have committed to that and that we are growing. So they're, you know, one of many of our tools. Commissioner Skinner, I didn't mean to interrupt. Did you have a follow-up? I did not. Thank you, Crystal. No problem. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Just, just a comment. I just, you know, I guess I'm just uh, really proud of our commitment. And this is another example of how we are, really are intentional about this work and how much it, it means to this commission. So thank you, Crystal, um, for um, taking the lead on this. And um, it's a really important program. Thank you. Yeah. And and just to build on this, of course, Karen, um, you're implementing the commission's um, equity, diversity and inclusion statement of purpose. And one of the five action items is on procurement. So it's right we're really, we're gonna be the beneficiaries of um, the Greater uh, Boston Chamber of Commerce's Paysetters program to help us fill that. And in turn, in turn, the MGC has, has a good record to share with them. And we all can be very proud of that. You have best practices to share. And Crystal, you've been working at the core of that. So it's all good all around. Thank you, Karen, for, for um, making sure that we participate in that program fully. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the organizational chart uh, and major policymaking position designation. So uh, under 23K, I'm required as the executive director to keep an organizational chart on file with the Secretary of State. I'm just going to share my screen right now just to show what uh, the current updated chart is. So I just want to make a, a couple of notes. One. Crystal's position is new, this chief administrative officer to the chair and special projects manager. Also, uh, Marianne Dooley's position of executive assistant has also been modified, it includes now the office operations manager. Uh, the other uh, organizational move we've done is, you can see here in this box uh, on the right, towards the right, uh, we are um, hiring and uh, we have a new uh, employee starting tomorrow as our chief people and diversity officer. Uh, that is David Muldrew, so we're really looking forward to him. Um, the, the term chief people officer is a well-recognized term in the world of HR, and you see that he'll be uh, overseeing uh, the folks that work in HR. Uh, he will be the lead there. So we're combining uh, that position with our internal and external diversity work. Um, David himself has 30 years of experience in HR in both the state and the private sector, and there'll, there'll be more to come when I introduce him, but I just wanted to acknowledge he'll be leading those efforts. Um, this is critical, and what, you know, we had some internal discussion about creating this position. You know, we are in a new environment where uh, there's hybrid work, we're post-COVID, uh, we're really focusing right now on the culture of our agency and making this a positive place to work. Uh, so I'm looking forward to working with David on that uh, and his expertise in this area. So uh, right now, uh, I, I want to just open up if there's any questions on that, any questions about the org chart. And then I just wanted to go over with the commission, uh, the major policymaking positions. As we all know, the, those of us uh, who are required to file the statement of financial interest, there has to be a designation of a major policymaking position first. And uh, uh, the general counsel and I have gone over these. We have the proposed list. Uh, 
we were thinking it may be appropriate for the commission to vote on that, to approve that. I'll defer to the commission how they want to handle that. Um, but before I go into the list of the major policy making positions, I just wanted to see if there's any comments or questions on the org chart. Anything? Okay. All right. So the major policy making positions for the commission uh, are proposed to be the commissioners, the executive director, the general counsel, the director of the IEB, chief enforcement counsel, the gaming agents division chief, the chief of the financial investigations division, the licensing division chief, the chief information officer, the chief of the division of community affairs, the communications division chief, the chief financial and accounting officer, the director of racing, and the new employee, the chief people and diversity officer. So that's the uh, proposed list. I'll you know, defer to Kathy um, if you want to, to set it up as a vote or just an approval for, for us to go forward. Uh, Cause that's, uh, I think the general counsel makes those, um, does the, the paperwork for filing that and notifying folks that they have to file a statement of financial interest. Yeah, so I like this process a lot, Karen and, and Todd. Um, this of course applies to um, our obligations under by statute under the state ethics um, law. And uh, Todd has been navigating that system. The Ethics Commission has a very nimble um, um, automated uh, program, which has assisted everybody in this front. But what it really requires is, of course, those individuals to uh, file a statement of financial interest. And Commissioner Cameron, just a reminder, that you'll have to do one this yes. year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she has to do one next year. So the next yeah. calendar year, yeah. Yeah. She has to file now and, it's, and, and file next year, right? It's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Todd, um, our deadline, uh, can you remind folks of that just right now while you have the chance? It's so May 1st every year. Okay. It comes around quickly. Um, we'll get some reminders. So that's May 1st. But um, Commissioner O'Brien, I think that probably when in one of our meetings with um, the legal team and Karen, we talked about this process. I don't know if you have a better memory than I do about whether we thought we needed to vote. I think it, at the very least, it was important for us to be informed of the those who would be um, designated major policy makers. Yeah, I don't remember whether we said we needed to vote on it or wanted to. I think it might have been that we would present it to the commission as a whole and see if there was a desire to vote on it. Uh, but at a minimum, we thought it was good to air in reference to the org chart who was going to have to file an SFI. And yeah. Karen, I, I just want to make sure I heard clearly in terms of relation to the org chart. So is it the commissioners, the ED, head of IEB, and then that line of sort of the green directors? Yes, and, and then also, and also the uh, obviously state police they, that that's separate, but then the right. orange, the orange box is below that. Okay. All right. And for those of you who may not have been designated that, <clears throat> it's a judgment call, um, and um, it's in no, no way um, implicates really your impact on policymaking. Um, it may spare you the obligation of having to file the SFI <laughs> more than anything. Um, and the Ethics Commission helps in thinking about that. Um, quite frankly, I think most of our team and almost all of your individual roles impacts the execution of our policy. So for that, we're thankful, but this is strictly a, a technical an important designation. I like this process where Todd works with Karen and then presents to us. But unless uh, Commissioner Skinner and Commissioner Hill, you think that we should vote formally and that would be fine as a matter of record, we could do that. Um, Brad, you're familiar with this process. Keisha, you um, had the same role in terms of having been a general counsel. What do you think? Take your input. I am just fine relying on the uh, counsel of, of, of Todd and our executive director. Excellent. Same Commissioner Hill? Yep. Okay. Thank you. And, and I think actually, Karen, this was a pretty good timing for your obligation to do sort of it together. Okay. It all worked good. out. Yeah. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. 
Uh, the next item on the agenda on the administrative update, I have office lease discussion. So our office lease is up at the end of the next calendar year. So we wanted to get uh, some discussion going because there are some policy decisions to be made regarding uh, what we're going to do with the office lease. And given that this is the public meeting is the only time I can talk to you all together, uh, I just wanted to flag a few issues for you and sort of start that discussion. Obviously, no decisions will be made today. Marianne Dooley is coordinating those efforts for uh, the uh, for the MGC as the office operations manager. She has been in touch with DCAM. Uh, Eric Lennon as the CFO is also in, in the mix on, the, on those discussions. But given that we are gonna be meeting with them, it would be helpful to get a sense of you know, what direction uh, we're going in, what your thoughts are, particularly, um, you know, we're coming out of COVID, we've got the hybrid work model. So I've just got a little bit of a, you know, my notes, a little bit of a decision tree to sort of start the discussion and any input you have would be really helpful. Um, one of the major decision points uh, is going to be, do we want the same amount of space we have now so we have the ability to have everyone in, in the office at the same time, or do we potentially want to reduce the space? And um, that's, a, that's a critical question. Um, if we do end up keeping the same space, um, do we want to talk to the landlord and see, given um, the, the uh, market for commercial space and also you know, the fact that, you know, I'm looking out my window, there is, you know, this building that's now wrapping around us and it's, it's tough right now. So do we want to talk to the landlord about getting a potential deal on, uh, on extending our lease? We may have, a, I think, a potentially a five-year option to renew and working out some kind of uh, deal with them. If we uh, want to keep the same amount of space, we also have the option of looking elsewhere. We could uh, stay in Boston and look elsewhere, or we could look at other locations. There are certainly uh, positives and negatives to that. Uh, there's impacts on the diversity of our workforce, uh, parking, uh, you know, change would be good for some, but potentially not good for others. So is there a potential for losing employees if we move offices? So that's it. That's if we keep this uh, same amount of space. If we reduce the space, then the question becomes, do we go to another site? Um, whether in Boston or another location or same building, and do we try to do something within our office space and reduce it? Um, some of the questions that have come up regarding the office, uh, redu reducing the office space, which I just want to highlight because it may sound good in theory, but there are some caveats. Um, we'd have to potentially reduce the number of offices. So are people that are used to having an office, are they going to be comfortable potentially either sharing an office or, or working in a, in a workstation. Um, you'd also have to re potentially reduce the number of cubes. So that involves hoteling space versus having your own space with your pictures and in, in your own things in your work area. Uh, we would also, if we reduce the space, what does that mean for the public meeting room and for our live stream equipment and all that, uh, and the lab as well? Um, the other factor, which I think we need to think about, is the ability to be all in the office on, on the same days. That's something you know, I've been thinking about. Do we want, you know, um, I would like at this point, at a minimum, to do certain days every month where uh, people are all in the office at the same time. Um, if we reduce the office space, that may be problematic. So I just wanted Fox to be aware of that. The other counter to that is, is cost. If we reduce the office space, there may be a cost savings. Um, uh, and then also once we're in a lease, because we expect to sign a lease, we're, we're committed. So once you do it, you, you, you're, you're kind of stuck with that uh, amount of space for a while. Um, and then the other things I, were, I was talking with uh, Marianne about are, uh, the cost of the move and then the disruption involved with the move. So these are all sort of factors we have to think about. And as we uh, start the discussion with DCAM, there is a, if we are going to do uh, some kind of RFP for office space, it, it can be involved. So we really do need to get going. So I'm just outlining some of the issues to start the um, thought process and any kind of feedback you have for me uh, as we start these meetings with DCAM would be really helpful. Um, because ultimately, some, as you can see, they're, they're real policy decisions and they affect the, the culture of the agency and, and, our, and our ability to work. So 
just throwing that out there for any kind of feedback, please let me know. Um, you know I'll turn it over if there's any comments for me at this point. Commissioners, you, Commissioner Hill, do you want to start? No, Commissioner O'Brien? Sure. Or, Commissioner Hill, were you going no or? I'm um, sorry. You want to, you can, you can hold if you want, if you want to hear. I, I'm all set. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, I'm sure you're doing this, Karen, but I would assume this process starts with conversations with the directors in particular and yourself in terms of what is the bare minimum to your point. I mean, you were listing some of the things I was thinking of, which is, yeah. you know, IT is going to need a certain amount of space for it and the lab and, you know, the investigations group is going to have to have a certain amount of space to conduct interviews, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then there is sort of the wish list of, okay, ideally, how many employees are we going to have? That I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's going on in terms of a minimum square footage. That thing. Yeah, and that was one thing uh, Marianne and I had discussed. And part of this, it, it, it's the uh, it's with the hybrid model. It's it's the hoteling space is, is part of the issue. But ultimately, what we're going to need to present to DCAM, how much space do we need? And that involves those discussions as well. So that's yes, that that is uh, on Marianne's list there. And is DCAM involved in a potential negotiation on the option to renew, or is that just between us and the landlord? I think that is, and Derek's on. Derek can, and can probably give you more detail on that. That is true. Yeah, so DCAM's our leasing agent, being a state okay. agency, so they would have to take the lead in that. Uh, I have reviewed the lease. It doesn't give any actual timeline for renewals, but it does say, you know, DCAM and the lease and our landlord can meet and discuss renewals or we have to go back out to um, bid. And as far as space goes, we would have to give the general ideas and the number of employees and their kind of um, working conditions that are needed. And DCAM actually has an average square footage per type of employee that they allocate when they do this type of stuff. Yeah. So, we so that's something that fits more with their calculation than yeah, I mean. that's absolutely their calculation. Okay. And how do they deal with things like the lab? So the lab, we would tell them what we need and we would, they would um, okay. come out and give us like, we'd say we need this many slot machines and they'd say, well, what's the industry standard for space in between slot machines? And, you know, they come up with the configuration for all the electricity and how it would hang in there um, and work with the, with the building on that. Um, all the, all the um, potential tenants. Uh, I mean, landlords that we've done. So they take a big lead in it. We just say, okay. this is the type of space we need. Um, and these are the types of employees we're going to have. And if we do the hoteling issue, they've done this a lot with the executive branch. So they'll give us what the recommendations are. And that's where we'd have to come up with, are we going to continue to be, you know, hybrid long-term? And if we are, um, how can managers share offices? What's the best way of becoming electronic? Or is it just hoteling space with a lot of breakout rooms? Um, that's the type of options they'd be giving us um, to think about what the square footage would be. And Joan could probably help us with that because she's been doing a lot of that on the executive branch as well. Commissioner Skinner? Well, Commissioner Hill, are you chiming in now? Yes. Thank so, you. Um, I don't know if I missed this because I'm actually having a little issue with my um, volume here. Has there ever been any talk about leaving Boston or are we always going to be in Boston? Ultimately, that's a commission question. I mean, this is, this is you know, uh, a major policy decision uh, at the highest level where we're going to be. So if we keep the same space, obviously we would stay here or, well, let me, let me rephrase. I've got looking at my decision tree. If we keep the same amount of space, we could stay here Theoretically, or we could move somewhere else if you want to keep the same amount of space. If we reduce the amount of space, we could try to do it somehow in the building, or we could move to another location. Uh, so really, the, the options are out there uh, in both scenarios. And that's why I'm trying to get a little sense from the commission of the direction we're going, because that's going to help uh, facilitate the process with DCAM. But that was part of the discussion the first time around. The commission did make a conscious decision to stay, to be in Boston, um, but they did have that, those, those discussions. Will they be outside of 
um, boss and, and Commissioner Cameron can probably fill you in on that because she was part of those initial meetings before there were any staff. Right. Commissioner Cameron? Well, it, yeah, I do remember all those conversations of where, sh where we should be. And, it, it, you know, I, I was open minded because um, I had never worked in Boston, even though I grew up in the state. I had never worked in Boston. But I think um, because of the, uh, the we were a new agency and there were a lot of issues we had to work out with the legislature, with the attorney general's office and other state agencies, we thought it was prudent to stay in Boston for those reasons, to have that proximity um, and the ability to quickly um, meet with the folks that uh, we needed to meet with in order to build this agency. But that has changed. And um, um, I think everything should be on the table, right? For this, for all of you to uh, think what's necessary now for the new chapter of this agency. Commissioner so, Skinner. Uh, oh, sorry, Commissioner Brian. Just following up on that, I know when I was in some other agencies, we would joke that we wished we had satellite offices. You know, when I was in the AG's office, we had a presence in Springfield and New Bedford and Worcester and things. Has it all been a, uh, a discussion of downsizing the base office in a way that would allow for other options? I'm also just thinking about retention of employees with hybrid, et cetera. Right, right. Is that um, something you thought about? So one of the things we thought about, and Derek, please chime in to join me on this, because Derek and I have been working together, is, uh, you know, for example, do you put the lab somewhere else and have that in a, at a different location? Uh, my conversations with Katrina, that can be challenging because of oversight and integration mm -hmm. of new employees that are there. You know, we do have, obviously, satellite offices in each casino with our gaming agents and state police and licensing you know, with, uh, folks are, are there on occasion as well. Um, but we, you know, part of the issue is we're not a huge agency. You know, we've only got what a hundred plus civilian employees. So it, that could be challenging. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Derek, or any other conversations you've had. We haven't had any conversations other than the lab about satellite offices. So that's a new concept and we would have to work through the logistics of how, how you would manage it, how you would keep that cohesive office environment that we're trying to do through the hybrid um model but it i think as commissioner cameron said earlier all options are on the table right this is the time you usually get locked into a five to ten year lease so um we should talk about all these things so we're not kicking ourselves um in a year or two i, I certainly would like to see um us look at maybe moving out of boston one cost savings but two um, a lot of us were talking or laughing this morning about the traffic situation and um, how difficult it is to get into Boston. Um, maybe it'd be easier somewhere else. Food for thought. The licensees would echo that. We've heard that in each budget meeting for the last four to five years. Um, so that it has been a regular conversation, I know, across senior staff, and we have brought it. It's actually been brought up in public budget discussions uh, with the commission in the past. So um, I don't think you're out of line asking for that. I think that's um, something that everyone would like to consider um, the, the positives and negatives of. Yeah, I, I understand that and I absolutely wanna talk about it. I do think there's a benefit to the Boston presence. That's kind of why I broke the idea of different spaces because our need to continue to communicate with the legislature, with partners in the HE's office that we're communicating with, that is helpful to be here. And also the, if and when we are going back to public meetings, which you know, for some, I feel like there will be a trend that will land somewhere you know, for closer to that than we are right now. I have concerns about making sure we pick a location, particularly for the public meeting space that allows for public transportation in. Um, because I just don't want to put us out somewhere where we are now off in some office complex where if you don't have a car, you can't get to us. So I would throw that out for one of the things that I would want to think about. If it helps at all, I know um, cannabis chose to move to Worcester um, for public transportation reasons, but they do have a small Boston office for those very reasons when there are meetings here. Um, and so they have a Boston presence with a very small office, but their main headquarters are out in Worcester. I haven't heard a report of how that's 
um, going, um, but they did make that decision uh, early on to have the satellite office here. Commissioner Skinner, we haven't heard from you. So I, I think Karen laid out some, some really good considerations um, for reviewing the, the direction of the lease in Boston. Um, but I, I think it would behoove us to first have a meaningful conversation about sort of the future of work um, for the agency. I know we are on a hybrid um, work model, but my understanding is that is a pilot right now. So we should, is, is that right, Karen? Am I misunderstanding? Well, technically we originally did a pilot for the first, uh, I don't know how long it was, Kathy, uh, you know, couple of months and then the commission did approve it as a policy. Now, like any policy, policies can be updated. So it's sort of in effect at, at the time, but the, the term pilot was, was, was the prior policy that was for a few months while we tested it out. Um, so that's the status we're at right now. Got it. The, the point being that um, if, we are, if we are really trying to map out sort of a space footprint for, for our, our colleagues, um, then I think we really need to understand who needs to be in the office um, how many days a week, um, just on a longer term basis, what equipment they're going to need, what kind of space they'll need, whether it's a hotel space, whether it's office space, and really just kind of map that out. Because until we do that, I don't know that we can sort of meaningfully um, hunt for other space because that sort of serves as the basis. Um, so if I, if I had something to offer, it would be, you know, that we, um, initiate discussions to really nail that piece of it down. Um, and I think a couple people intimated at this, Derek, um, Commissioner O'Brien, just in terms of, um, you know, who needs private space, who doesn't, who needs, uh, who, can, who can be uh, uh, in a hotel space, you know, when the um, uh, commissioners, uh, you know, get together, um, in a public meeting, where is that, where's that going to be held? Um, and even I'm looking forward to having all the staff in the office at the same time. So um, definitely want to voice my, my uh, uh, um, support for a space that's large enough to um, accommodate that. Right. And that, that, that's a good point. Like that's tricky. Cause if you do want days when everybody's in the office, you can't, shr you can't shrink it too much or at all, because then, you know, People don't have workstations. So it's, you know, these policy decisions on um, people being in the office. Yeah. So I think this is a critical discussion. It is um, very pertinent. Um, <clears throat> we were in a pandemic for two years where um, significant decisions were made that were driven by public health um, considerations. We're now emerging from that and, and folks, have grown very comfortable working from home. Well, I think there's also a lot of evidence that there is something lost when you don't have a, a, a community at work. So um, I uh, think, Karen, you've got all the considerations underway. I think what would be, I think uh, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Skinner both talked about some process that could be done. I suspect that people, um, are able to reach out to both some private sector um, uh, businesses that are, are going through this, uh, perhaps the uh, Greater uh, Chamber of Boston Commerce would be able to, to give um, some input. The one thing that might separate us from the executive branch, and, and I have to say, it, speaking with some former colleagues, they, they thought that we might have just gotten it perfect to have three days of management, two days, of um, staff. I mean, honestly, I, I wish it were three days across the board so that there were more opportunities for us all to see each other more frequently. Um, but I also know that there's some real benefits in, in working from home and, and that, that flexibility that we've seen. Um, so my point is a caution about making a big turn that's irreversible without a lot of good um, information and data. And the truth is, is we're in a really luxurious position because we still have that space and we might have some opportunity to 
to extend. We might have some opportunity to leverage, as you mentioned, Karen. Um, I caution about um, any quick decisions here, although we, in other words, like today or tomorrow, right, right, right. but you're, you're, the process is underway and it's a good one to get going on. Yeah. Um, another group that might be helpful to speak with is our friends at the lottery and the treasury because they did move to, you know, Commissioner Hill, it's, you know, quite right. We do deal with, with Boston traffic. I also see that as a plus that there's traffic. I, ha I hate to say it. That means all the small restaurants that have closed up might come back to life. All of the, you know, the cities, um, the, everything that makes Massachusetts special in its cities might come back to life and that comes along with traffic. Um, but they did, um, they were in Braintree for quite a good time, uh, time um, but the, it was quite removed from the red line station there. So under Mike Sweeney's leadership, they did make a decision to move to the uh, Dorchester location closer to the city so that they could access better public transportation and diversify their, their um, employee base. We are at a very good number. Um, I have no idea in terms of our diversification, in terms of how that plays out for location here but it was a consideration I know for the lottery. They have a much bigger group. I think they're like 400 strong or something. But um, they're now, I think right across the street, right from the red line. So, you know, that is like, like Gail said, um, uh, Chair Hoffman uh, really looked at that, that issue and, um, and made that move. So it's, there's a lot of considerations. But I like that you started with culture, Karen, um, and, and imagining what you want your team to feel like and what you want it to look like on a daily basis. So maybe we can put this on um, as a kind of a regular reporting, yeah. but I also think, Todd, that if it comes down to any negotiations or strategies, I think there is, or if we start talking about actual leasing, there are um, an executive session for us to be able to discuss that for, to preserve um, strategy considerations, am I right? <laughs> I think that's right, we can start taking a look at that. So. Yeah, so um, that would, so there would be kind of the culture and then if there's any strategy decisions, we could go into executive session. But I think commissioners, do you like the idea of maybe get, having Karen keep this on a little bit of a regular cadence as she and her team work it out because I, I, I do think we have to be kind of we have to be part of the early conversation and not just a, a, a reactive decision maker yeah exactly exactly so I definitely welcome any input as you can see from the discussion once you start talking about it, it's like oh but what about this or oh what about this so it's really uh it's not necessarily it's a, an obvious answer all the time so we may want to uh, I, I like the idea of a recurring conversation because I really welcome the input and, and the help on this because it's, it's, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. it's and I do point. know, um, I do know the executive branch really did reduce its footprint over this period. I don't know the extent that they preserved common space so that, you know, full agencies could get together. I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, if you're imagining at least once a month, everybody getting together, do we have to rent out space? You know, you you will think about that, and, exactly. and, how, and how we are efficient. So, okay. I was also thinking about the cannabis analogy. Um, the one thing that I think does distinguish us from that is they have sort of even statewide jurisdiction. Yeah, we are more Eastern Mass in terms of two of the three existing casinos are here. The fourth Region C would put us more geographically in terms of what we're overseeing in the uh, Eastern half of the state. So in terms of thinking about other geographic locations to base things, um, just something to keep in mind. I think it's, I'm, I'm curious to know how cannabis is faring with that setup of a base out in Worcester with just a satellite in Boston to sort of hopefully satisfy what we need. Um, but I do think there is a little bit of a difference when we look at other agencies, we have to remember where, what's their jurisdiction, what's, What's ours in terms of geography? 
Okay. Excellent. All very helpful. So you know, to be continued, and if you could keep thinking about it and uh, any ideas, I, I am I'll, definitely. But it's a, is it one year, six months, truly? One year, nine months, yeah. Nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, More than two babies. I know, but it's the process does take a while if we're going to do an RFP, so we want to make sure we're on top of it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so that's very yeah. helpful. Thank you. So keep thinking. Um, and Thank then the you. last the last item on the uh, administrative update, I just wanted, because um, Play My Way is launching out in Springfield today as a fitting end to Problem Gambling Awareness Month, and uh, Mark is out there uh, for the launch, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize not only the launch of the program, but to also to recognize uh, the efforts of Mark and his team and the IT team uh, and MGM Springfield in making that happen. Um, they, and Play My Way is an innovative budgeting tool designed um, to allow customers to set the budget and monitor what they spend across electronic games. It's a voluntary tool um, and it can help them just sustain uh, a budget um, and eliminating regret after going to a casino. So partnering with the casinos on you know, things like this with respect to uh, problem gaming, uh, prevention initiatives, really, really helpful. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge the end of Play My Way. I see Daniel Miller's there and he's got his t-shirt on, love it. So how is that going out there, Daniel? It's so far very well. Um, we, we actually began uh, running the program to the slot floor Monday morning, um, and it has continued obviously up until today as the, the official launch. Um, by about three o'clock yesterday afternoon, we had about 200 members who had signed up and enrolled, um, and about 170 of that had redeemed their $10 uh, food credit as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely gathering momentum. Hopefully with today's event, uh, the press uh, event at one o'clock, should expand that as well. But uh, yeah, happy to be wearing the Play My Way yep. colors today. <laughs> you know, and I do want to recognize Springfield because they they are the lead on this. They voluntarily took this on. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the, the coupon. The uh, casino itself is, is don you know donating or uh, contributing 50% of that. So they're actually contributing funds to get people into the program, which I think is really uh, remarkable and shows their commitment to uh, dealing with issues around responsible gaming. So thank you to MGM. I'm sure Mark is doing well out there, running around, getting everything ready, but just wanted to acknowledge that and say thank you to MGM. He, he is on the floor as we speak. I'm getting zinged with emails as we go, and I'm, I'm almost like in operation control up in my office. Okay. I'm not sure it's, it's working. Okay, it's, uh, great. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Take care, everybody. And yeah. thank Karen, you. If, I, if Daniel, if I could just chime in, I did have a chance to speak with um, President Kelly and to thank, um, thank him. Um, for his leadership and stewardship on, on um, bringing Play My Way on board. Um, it's an exciting program today. You know, I know that the commissioners would have loved to have been there, but we've got a lot of action going on here too today, Daniel. It's just May 31st is a big day here. Um, but Chris um, Kelly, the leadership from the very top at MGM under first Jim Murren and now Bill Hornbuckle have embraced responsible gaming here in Massachusetts and um, I'm sure Chris will at some point share the words, but he said that it is not lost on him and all of you at MGM that the legislature from the very start um, got this commitment right. Again, to uh, Commissioner Hill, you, you understand that. But what he, I liked his words, he called it the gold standard in the nation. So we'll let Chris share that publicly. But um, I also want to acknowledge that um, Mayor Sarno and um, Commissioner um, Helen Cauldron Harris will be there. Um, she's the public health commissioner who also serves on the GPAC. Uh, and, and that um, representation from the city, Daniel, of course, elevates um, exactly the import of today's launch. Um, we love that the city of Springfield has been really a great steward of responsible gaming as well for, for um, MGM. And so I want to just say a big thank you. And I, I know my fellow commissioners would join me and in, in, in if you want to weigh in. But again, thank you, Daniel. We know it's a busy, busy day. We can't wait to hear all about it at the end of the day. Commissioners, anything you want to add? Okay. Thank you. And, and, and good luck. 
Thank you, Lady Chair. And, and if I may, just a, a sidestep slightly from playing my way, just a, a very big welcome to Commissioner Skinner and a, a farewell to uh, Lady Commissioner Cameron. Uh, best wishes in anything that you do next. Yeah. Just a real thank you. Um, it was nice to come out and see you all in person and very much appreciated um, hearing about all the new developments and uh, the t-shirt looks cool, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so that concludes the administrative update for this morning. Okay. That was, I didn't realize that Daniel was going to be able to join Karen. That's excellent. Thank, and thanks, Crystal, for tipping me off. Um, but now we're turning back to Crystal, uh, Howard. Uh, today, uh, Crystal, you've made several contributions. And for that, we're very, very appreciative. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting program. I had to be reminded on a few of the facts from Crystal last night. So I look forward to this presentation from you and the colleagues at LEAF. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm just really happy to present to you guys today, Amin Benali, uh, Managing Director for Strategy and Development at the Local Enterprise Assistance Fund, which we call LEAF internally, and you've heard that term a few times, but I've had the pleasure of working with him since day one of this grant effort, back when I was an ADBD program manager uh, for workforce and diversity development. So. Um, I did compile a lot of the background on their work uh, for you in the memo, but I'm not going to go too far into it because I've seen Amin's presentation and he's uh, covering some of that in a great way. So by way of brief introduction, our contracted efforts with LEAF began in FY19 when they responded to our RFR for a business technical assistance vendor. And after a competitive procurement process and grant review, they received the initial award. Now, over three years later, this uh, just this week, actually, we executed the contract for $150,000 with the procurement team. Thank you, Derek, John Scully, and Noel, um, to not only continue the great efforts that Amin's team has made with the MBE, VBE, and WBE, uh, WBE businesses, as well as our licensees. So it's uh, a conglomerate effort. But um, to develop and now launch a new portal, aiding and advancing the pipeline for diverse business and supplier diversity goals across the state. So I will let uh, Amin take uh, the rest of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Can you hear me, right? Yes. That's very good. good morning, um, yes. Good morning to you, uh, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you and to present our activities with regard to you. procurement diversity. Um, thank you also to the Mass Gaming Commission, commissioners, the executives and the staff for your commitment to procurement diversity. Um, thank you to Crystal and to Derek for your continued trust and support of our work. And uh, also special thanks to the casino staff who have assisted our work um, with meetings, with insight, and also with the opportunity to support their vendors. Um, so clearly this was a team effort and, and continues to move forward. Um, and, and we're hoping to be positive contributors to, to this effort. Um, in the time I have in front of you today, uh, I'd like to use a slide deck um, to go over some of the points I'd like to make um, in the first part, and then uh, maybe take you on a tour of the tool that we've uh, created and hope to continue to develop to support um, procurement diversity within the gaming establishments and institutionally broadly in the state as well. So I will share my screen, um, if you give me just a second to position myself. <clears throat> Like Crystal, I also use three screens and I hope to not lose sight of where I am. Okay, so you should be seeing the, uh, the title slide uh, at this time, I hope. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. So I'll start just by brief comments about who we are. Um, LEAF, uh, we are a nonprofit community development financial institution. We're certified by the US Treasury. We were established in 1983 uh, with the goal of supporting cooperatives and disadvantaged business enterprises generally. Um, we provide, uh, historically we have provided financing solutions. Um, so patient flexible capital in the form of um, loans. And we've also provided pro bono technical assistance to disadvantaged enterprises. Uh, it takes the form of advisory services on financial management, 
capital advisory and um, and any issues that the businesses face and, and need support with on the financial management, cash flow management side of things. Uh, we're guided by our mission to improve the lives of people and households in the communities um, that we serve. Um, as Crystal said, you know, we started our partnership, um, you know, though we applied late in 2019, uh, in February 2020 uh, was sort of when we started the work uh, to provide technical assistance and advisory services to uh, current and potential vendors. And the idea would be to provide, would ha have been to provide uh, capital as needed as well. And so this was a, a, a short five weeks before um, the COVID-19 health emergency took hold in the state. And, um, you know, March 2020, as we know, um, the businesses um, the shut down um, and uh, our activities shifted to help support the local businesses and uh, our focus <clears throat> remains with disadvantaged enterprises, so women and BIPOC owned businesses and the goal of helping them survive the economic fallout from the pandemic. So in the March 2020, still early on and, and a, a lot of uh, uh, lack of visibility into the future. Um, in supporting the businesses, so in addition to continuing to support the vendors um, for the gaming establishments, um, uh, we provided intensive support to women and BIPOC owned businesses. If you remember at the time, um, the relief efforts, the PPP and BIDL programs, the early versions of those um, did not reach um, a lot of the disadvantaged populations in the state. And so uh, along with a number of coalitions and initiatives, um, we embarked on uh, an effort to reach out to as many uh, enterprises as we could and inform them of their eligibility and help them with the application process. And, and through that, we were able to reach over a thousand um, businesses, over actually 1400 businesses and several million dollars were dispersed in relief funds were dispersed to those, uh, to those entities that needed the most. Um, part of our advisory work also had been to help the relief negotiations with lenders and landlords. Um, you know, early on, that there was it was a very stressful time on both sides, and so we had to step in and 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 and, and help negotiate workouts with the different parties. Um, you know, all of this provided on a pro bono basis to to the businesses. Um, you know, we are a founding member of the Coalition for an Equitable Economy, which was uh, birthed uh, from the pandemic with an effort of uh, bridging the and eliminating the, the wealth gap in the Commonwealth. Uh, we continue to be strong supporters of the coalition efforts, um, uh, which which rely on providing access to advisory services and technical assistance, um, capital as needed um, to the businesses, and also procurement opportunities to disadvantaged uh, populations. Um, through that, uh, we established partnerships with a number of um, uh, business support organizations in the state. You know, we, as a nonprofit CDFI, we had several partnerships, but COVID-19 emergency brought us all together in a deeper way, and, and our connections uh, were stronger, our tr trust was, was greater, and we had access to each other's businesses, um, you know, with warm introductions that, that usually um, are required to establish trust uh, with the businesses. So through uh, that period, uh, our team alone interacted with over 170 businesses, um, the vast majority of which were minority business enterprises or, and, and women-owned enterprises, um, and the vast majority of which also uh, was uh, uh, Massachusetts-based businesses outside of Boston, and, and we also interacted with a fair number of businesses um, within Boston. And this, these statistics are for 2020 um, alone. Um, so uh, the, the reason I wanted to go to this background is because uh, that work informed um, our work for Mass Gaming Commission um, in that our overarching objective had always been to expand the universe of local MWBE suppliers available um, um, for procurement. And um, so our work with several of these co coalitions gave us access to over a thousand businesses, the ones we have interacted with um, uh, directly and the ones we had access to through the partnerships uh, with these business support organizations. And the message we had from both vendors and buyers, um, you know, had been the same that, um, you know, the, the, the vendors, you know, wanted to do business, they, they needed access to these institutional contracts because of the visibility that it gives them into a longer term period. And, um, and the buyers as well wanted to be able to support the communities where they, where they were uh, situated um, and also to meet their own needs for services and products that they needed. And um, you know, our assessment was that you know, the tools and the information set to connect the buyers and sellers um, needed to be enhanced. 
um, it existed, but it was just needed to be enhanced. And, and we felt that this was a function that we could serve and, and, and provide relief to both sides of the, of the market. So to that end, we set up on a screening process where you, there are many lists um, available that have information about um, uh, DBE um, um, uh, candidates in the States. Um, that includes the, 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 the State Diversity Office um, uh, databases and a few other organizations. And we also created uh, another one based on our work on the PPP and the IDL and the re relief efforts, businesses that were you know, not certified or uh, maybe were interested in being certified, but just didn't know that the process existed or didn't want to go through it and needed help to, to go through that. And um, we, uh, our process was one of identifying the information, um, doing as much data cleaning as possible, um, and to the extent that there is information that is out of date or uh, erroneous or um, not helpful to, to, to eliminate that, replace it with information that would be actionable. Um, the uh, establishments, the, the casinos were, were kind to provide us with their um, product and services and commodities matrix, and these are the required services that they use. And we were able to use that to make assignments to the databases so that we can match businesses with products and services that they provide. And then uh, we wanted this to be a little bit of a high touch um, process where there's a human interaction with the business, understanding that trust is important in what we do. And so we created the sort of outreach list for our team um, to be able to contact, to seek these business owners and contact them and have a conversation with them, um, enlist um, their, um, their buy-in and, 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 and essentially make them ready to become vendors. Um, so kind of schematically what the process looked like, you know, out of a thousand, and again, this is just a pilot phase uh, for a small team. Um, so out of an initial uh, outreach of 211 businesses, um, uh, going through some certification validation process and, and establishing a fit for the products and services that are required and used by the buyers, um, you know, kind of that led to uh, identifying about 48 businesses uh, in the first pass of doing this um, that, 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 that were uh, top contenders. Um, brief description of uh, what those businesses, clearly this was uh, mostly in the hospitality space. Um, so hotel operations, maintenance services, event services, um, and about a third were, were women-owned enterprises, um, about another third were minority-owned enterprises. Um, a, a small slice will, was uh, veteran-owned enterprises. It's a notoriously difficult group to break into, but, but we have made some good in inroads by working with some chambers and commerce and leaning on our friends at the SBA. And then there was a large uh, contingent that um, either was not aware of certification or was not aware of the opportunity, but certainly uh, would have appreciated that opportunity. And the end result of all of this outreach was to create um, what we call actionable information. Um, and and uh, so this is information about the business that provides an overview um, of the business, um, their products, their capabilities, um, and um, their uh, previous institutional uh, buyers indicating their ability to handle institutional contracts. And we wanted um, to use this, the, the, the real estate, the, the, the report real estate in a way where information would be easily uh, identified, um, you know, so that two, two different reports don't have to look very different and the eye is trained to find the information it's looking for um, quickly and easily. And so that, that, that required a standardized format for these reports and they would be short. They would include information that is relevant um, and, and also information that is not so private about the business that, that it would have been infringed on their, on their confidentiality. So all of this is, is uh, public information. And we were able to share um, you know, these capability statements with the buyers and, and, and make connections as required as they felt there was need um, uh, for, uh, for, for contracting with some of these companies. And so um, our kind of concept solution that evolved out of this um, is one that we're calling a mix of high touch and low touch, you know, digital and human interface to create kind of that actionable set of information. Um, you know, at the center of it is the data aggregation and cleanup. So we have to be able to have information about these companies. We need to have a process to find the information and then also validate it and, and, and clean it up. 
And when we do that, then we, it leads to content development. So creating um, that, that interface and that report that, that delivers the information for the buyers to be able to make a quick assessment of whether this is a vendor that I want to be able to consider. And, um, and in order to take us out of the equation and make this sort of an autopilot project, um, create in, in intuitive access to that information so that we're not the ones pushing it out by emails um, you know, all the time, that they have access to it at any time uh, on demand and, and, and also give the ability to create personalized vendor lists and vendor portfolios. Um, and in doing that, also the ability to create benchmarks internally, um, how much expenditures do we, um, uh, what, is, what is the level of expenditures we can target and how are we doing with respect to, to those benchmarks. And uh, because we are a technical assistance team, um, you know, maybe this could become the technical assistance dispatch where when there is a challenge with a particular vendor, um, then it would be, it, there would be a quick tool to assign a TA provider um, to that vendor and, and, and deal with the challenge and resolve the, the problem and then report that, has, that, has, that that has been reported that has been dealt with um, in order to avoid situations where vendors are falling through the cracks and not coming back into, into the system. So um, we, so this is a quick snapshot. Uh, we created this uh, um, initiative for uplifting local procurement. We're calling Uplift Procure. The acronym is UPUP. We feel it's probably uh, appropriate given what we've gone through over the last two years. Uh, some more uplifting is needed. And the idea there is that it provides um, search uh, and filter functionality that is intuitive, um, uh, a capability statements repository that is kept up to date, that is not allowed to go stale. Um, you know, vendor portfolio design and management, uh, some uh, benchmarking and progress reporting to the extent it's needed internally for the buyers, um, and then seamless assignment of technical assistance um, uh, when needed. And a few more snapshots uh, of what we've kind of come up with. This is short, but I'll, I'll, when we go through it, uh, it'll, it'll probably be a little bit uh, more visible. Um, you know, where we have um, at this stage about 109 companies in the database. Um, and, and there's the ability to filter by uh, certification status, MBE, WBE, or VBE, uh, search by town to the extent local spending is um, has some layers of limitations, um, you know, with localities and counties and regions, et cetera. And, um, you know, the, 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 the industries list is currently limited to what we have access to through the matrices provided to us, um, very heavily tilted towards hospitality, but, you know, this will be expanded as we add, and our goal is to take this number from 109 to over 1,000. And, um, uh, so the next slide just shows uh, kind of what I went over, uh, the ability to, to, to filter very briefly and intuitively, but also to be able to click on individual companies and add them to um, uh, uh, an individual's or a buyer's portfolio so that they can keep track of who it is that they are interacting with or who they are researching and examining for uh, purchasing decisions. And then um, they can also go to their own portfolios and, and be able to see their portfolio makeup, how many MBEs and WEs are in the portfolio. And um, you know, having some uh, brief information about those uh, companies uh, in that portfolio and that information being fairly limited, but still insightful and, and snapshot type information. And uh, lastly, that uh, this would be a repository of these capability statements and this, this would be generated on demand. Um, the content will be um, uh, updated routinely by a team um, of analysts that is looking at the information. And then as it is updated, the content uh, on demand here will be updated as well. Um, so if you allow me, I will um, uh, uh, shift my screen to, uh, to, to the website. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Um, Bernali, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Crystal, is this a good time for the commissioners to ask questions or do we? Um, I'll just go through the website if it's all right, uh, briefly, and then I- That's what I thought, thank you. Minutes and then, sorry about that. My, um, I'm trying to position my computer. Um, I wondered if you wanted multiple to- Multiple screen break, problem. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to make sure that you didn't want to break now for some reason, okay. I like it when somebody is um, having trouble with the triple screen because I had to 
I had to turn two of my three in. <laughs> I almost mentioned that earlier, like you understand. <laughs> I do understand. I still had texted me about triple, a, a triple screen threat and I completely understood. Todd, I think you're a beneficiary of that. <laughs> had screens to share. And I, I truly apologize. This is taking longer than I... No, it's no... You know what? We don't get too nervous over this at all. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Can you, see, uh, can you see the uh, my uh, uh, website here? Yes. Yeah, we're back on the... Uh, yep, yeah, on the website. Thank uh, you. So um, uh, let me just zoom a little bit here. Um, as you can see, there is a login required. When you log in, it'll recognize the individual... Um, this is likely the most impactful um, uh, uh, component of the website um, with the screen functionality and the listed companies. We have about five pages of companies uh, listed here. And the idea is, uh, you know, we could, we could search by, um, uh, 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 in this particular case, MBE status alone, it would only show the companies that are MBE uh, companies. We can further refine that and only uh, include women-owned businesses, and it would include that as well. Um, and uh, we can, you know, add uh, companies uh, for evaluations. Uh, by simply by clicking on, on the companies. And as you can see, these companies will be uh, listed here. We can add them to the portfolio. And then uh, what the portfolio looks like at the moment, and this is evolving constantly, um, is uh, you know, a quick snapshot of the businesses uh, that were selected in the portfolio. And then what we've added here is little functionality where if there is a, a technical assistance request that um, when you click on the button, it sends an email to us um, with the request for support for the business. Um, and then some uh, descriptive information about, um, you know, about the, uh, the businesses that, uh, that the, the makeup of the, the businesses. And then uh, additionally, uh, we wanted to ensure that um, uh, the businesses have uh, that, that you know, uh, the buyers can access these capability statements easily and within each of the companies um, you click to on capability statements and um, you know these populate automatically and all the information is updated and we have been given some um, uh, advice on what to add for example uh, some of the uh, uh, licensees ask to have include a date for when the certifications expire um, and some other information that we're in the process of adding as well. Um, but all of this would, would continues to, we continue to add functionality to this website. Um, we haven't shared the login yet with the gaming establishment. We intend to do that over the next few weeks, uh, just the process of going through some glitches and um, you know, things like login, et cetera, that were taking longer than we expected. Um, and the project going forward continues to be, um, we have to continue to grow, um, to grow the database and grow the content once the platform and the technology is in place. And the value of this is, um, uh, the value of what we are producing here, uh, you know, is dependent on, um, uh, dependent on the, the content, that the content is valid and is, re and is val um, uh, actionable. And then with respect to our own mission and the test of this um, qualifying for our own mission, you know, what we're looking for in terms of outputs out of this is an increased coverage of um, uh, disadvantaged enterprises in the database, you know, improved content, um, having intuitive access to the data and um, expand the tool sets that are available to users um, so that they can make their decisions uh, with ease. Um, the impacts we'll be looking for is increased spending uh, locally, um, increased revenue visibility for the companies and the disadvantaged enterprises we work with, and better employment numbers um, in our communities. And finally, the outcomes will be a viable path to local wealth building. Um, this is sort of what we seek when we want companies to participate in the economic benefits of the large companies here, um, improved individual quality of life and uh, stable uh, communities. Um, so I will stop sharing here. It's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer uh, your questions. Uh, Thank you. Commissioners, do you have questions for Mr. Bernelli or for Crystal? What, um, <clears throat> yes, you do. Commissioner Cameron, I think, were you nodding your head? Oh, yes. I, I don't have questions, but I'm just amazed at the level of detail, the level of commitment, the, um, how much work goes into getting this right and how important the work is. 
So you, every every page you showed us, you did with enthusiasm, and uh, you know your commitment and your um, the, how much you care about this work is just evident. So I just um, was very interested in the presentation and did not realize the level of detail and um, it really does make a difference, right? In people's lives. So I just wanted to thank you for the work and explaining uh, in more detail uh, about what you do to us. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate your words. Thank you. Commissioner Bryan, are you leaning in? I did. I, I just wanted to reiterate what Commissioner Cameron said that I, I know people think sometimes procurement is dry and, you know, it doesn't have an impact, but having had some exposure to it when I was in the IG's office in terms of how cycles of, you know, almost being an incumbent vendor, you know, keep some people out of it and just the level of detail that's sometimes needed to be able to respond to RFPs, respond to requests from different companies to be able to get into this, uh, these opportunities. Um, I think you're doing a tremendous service um, for both both sides involved in the interaction to do exactly what people say, which is to try to make sure that the wealth is out there and going to different communities, and giving opportunities, because it is very often that first step in the door that would help um, WEs, VBEs, um, MBEs really start to get hold. So I, I think it's fantastic. Again, the level of detail, again, also, I know it's out there, had some exposure to it, but I was impressed with um, sort of the level of, and the depth of the detail that's gone into this. Thank you, Commissioner Bunch. Thank you. Commissioner Skinner, Commissioner Hill. We're all set, Commissioner Hill, Commissioner Skinner. All set? Um, there we go. I'm all set, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so I just, you know, um, as, as my fellow Commissioner said, this is such critical work. Um, <clears throat> If you had to identify still the biggest challenge for really augmenting your list of businesses, systemically, institutionally, what would you say it is, Mr. Bernelli? I, I, I thank you for your question, uh, Commissioner. The, um, I think at the moment, we, like most institutions, realize that we need to increase our resources and staffing. Um, when we set out to do this, we did not, uh, we were, uh, we understood technology had to be part of it, but we also understood that the human element had to be part of the solution, if it is integral to, to the success of this. And, um, and it was really our work during COVID-19 that solidified that belief. I mean, that belief had permeated in our work as a nonprofit um, for a very long time, but it was, it was, it was made more visible uh, during that time when we had to call uh, business owners, owners who were in crises and, and had to provide support for them. It, was, it, was, it is that level of empathy that's needed to gain the trust of the business owners to get their buy-in. And, and a mm -hmm. lot of times you'd be surprised how much you convincing you have to do to explain the opportunity and that you really should trust me on this list this, this and it's not it's it's not easy and i think that's the the challenge is to communicate the 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 necessity of this to the business owners i think to the to the credit of the licensed uh, the licensees and the staff there is clear commitment and desire to do this um, and and you know and, and it's 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 there, um, but when you get questions like where can we get this information? How do we find these businesses? Well, then it puts it on us. It's not, it's our failing if if they're not there. And and this is what we're trying to deal with is um, you know make sure that we are working with partners that know the businesses that can create that warm introduction, that warm meeting where you ex you have the time and the emotional space to to explain the opportunity. And to say, yeah, we should go through this process, get certified, and let's put you on the system. Let's give us more information about your company, what you can do. If you need capital, we are capital providers. We are connected with other capital providers that can help you. So um, the technology part, while uh, I would say cool, is a tool. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the emphasis on that. I would honestly put the emphasis on the, the humans that are out there. Uh, pounding the pavement, going to the site of the business owner, speaking with them, getting a sense of what they can and cannot do so that we're not making misrepresentations. And I think sometimes that what happens if you misrepresent what you're able 
to do and then you're not able to deliver, it kind of puts everybody back several steps and, and we hope to, to ensure that, 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 you know, we can eliminate it completely, but we minimize that. And if in fact it happens, we can, we can mitigate it. That's a tremendous answer because you really indicated that um, it's that trust factor that you have to establish. And, and I wondered if capital was one of the big systemic blocks, but I, I'm delighted to hear that, that you, um, you see a solution for that. And who is not going to repeat um, technology as cool as the tool? Um, that's a, a great saying, but it really does take that human element. Um, very inspired answer to a, uh, I wasn't sure what your answer would be. So thank you, Mr. Bernali. Excellent, excellent um, presentation. And just a reminder, Crystal and Derek, our investment um, has been here a few hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, yes, it kicked off. The first grant was um, a split, I think, I mean, correct me, was it 75,000 each at that point? That is correct, yes. That's and then it became, um, we, we, I mean, you can already see the dedication and commitment that LEAF has put into this, but the communication was solely really what was really driving their success. It, it's hard as a third party to tr go between us and the licensees and then also the businesses, and they were just really successful. So in that second iteration, they received 100,000, I believe. And now with this, uh, the one that was just released this week, which these have all been put out as an RFP process. And this was a best value contract that we had out um, because you can see this was not what we thought it would be. It just became um, that in those communications, there was something lagging. And as you can tell, this streamlines the content, those capability statements being there for our licensees and any other procurement interest. Um, they don't have to chase this down. It's available to them. And it just opens up who the vendors may be when they're looking at something versus, you know, how quick the procurement process can be for some of these, um, especially in our licensee um, procurements. They're putting it out there and trying to get the, they need to get it complete quickly. So this really aids in that. But as um, Leaf put, puts in these extra touches, even the certification you know, having that piece in there, if you're not a certified business, kind of encourages you to look into that further and make sure you get certified because that's a hold up a little bit. And it's been a component of what we've been doing for us over the time as well. And I think that was mentioned, but they, they have been and can be a, assistance to if, if the certification is a challenge. Um, and I know uh, it looked like Derek's hand was raised at one point, so I may be already addressing this, but uh, we've had this conversation internally as well. And this is a tool for MGC and for other entities too. It's, it's not, um, you know, we're trying to make this change over the entire state, but it's really been such an asset that the licensees would provide their input and look at this and say what they mean. So the communication is, is just, it's phenomenal to me because I know how difficult it can be. So. We've really appreciated Leaf's involvement. I hope the finalization of your launch on the website, uh, the technological tool continues successfully. Mr. Brunelli, it's really, really an important piece and you made it very clear for us today. Commissioners, do you have any other questions or Derek, did you want to weigh in on? Yeah, I, I, did just, I did just want to weigh in. I want to emphasize what Amin talked about earlier. This started off as a technical assistance program, and he started developing this tool, not because we gave him money to develop it, um, but because it was helpful to the licensees as well as to the businesses he's representing. And I have heard, you know, I've got 22 years in state government, 20 of which have been a direct procurer. Um, I think 18 have been a supplier diversity officer and I think 10 of them were a secretariat diversity, supply diversity officer. And we've heard this pitch, I can't tell you how many times about a electronic tool and where it falls down is the maintenance of it and making sure that the business capabilities um, because the cost of doing that far exceeds what we are providing as a grant to Amin and his team. Um, so that is the huge aspect that's going to be helpful to anyone using this tool. The fact that it's updated, it gives true um, business capabilities, it gives a quick um, glance. I mean, 
you know, the first time Crystal said she wanted me to see a database, I was like, okay, let's go see another <laughs> one. And then when, uh, you know, I started talking to Amin about what he's actually doing, that's a differentiator. I mean, the fact that his team is out there meeting with these people, helping with the certifications, um, keeping those business statements updated, keeping the certifications updated, working with the people to um, get the certifications updated because they don't have the staff that can do that. That's a differentiator here. And it costs a lot more than 150,000. I can tell you that. Um, so, you know, it's a great tool. I think we are very lucky with this partnership and I hope to see it continue. I'd love to see a thousand businesses in there. Thank you. We, we, we are committed to getting there. We're ramping up our hiring and, and this is a priority for us. Um, I think it completes our offering between capital advisory services and procurement service. I think it, it, we, we hope to, to, to help the, the businesses in the Commonwealth. Excellent, excellent. Any further questions? Mr. Bruno, you all set? Uh, Commissioner Hill, Commissioner Skinner. Okay, Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner O'Brien, all set. Very, um, very uh, interesting presentation. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, have a great day. Thank, thank you. you, good luck. Okay, uh, commissioners, um, we knew it was gonna be a good robust meeting today and I'm looking at the time. It's quarter to five. We have um, scheduled um, to have Dr. Lightbound and team go next. And then a break is predicted with a lunch around one. Are we still good with that format? I see Brad shaking his head. Are you okay, Commissioner O'Brien right now? I think we probably have Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right now. We, we, I'm, I'm sorry. We, we, we were going to work until one and then take a break. Is that what? No, we're going to well, take a break at 1150, but we're just running a little bit late. So if you, oh, if you don't mind. If okay. we were going to go till one, I would have asked for a break, but. Uh, well, Commissioner Cameron, I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent. We could certainly attend to uh, the next item first. Okay, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any urgency. Okay. All righty. Dr. Lightbound, good morning. Good morning. Um, today I have Stephen O'Toole, Director of Racing for Plain Ridge with us. Um, and the first item on is the um, operating and racing official approval for Plain Ridge. Everybody on that list is um, returning folks that, um, that have been approved by uh, the commission in the past except for uh, Charles Eaton III is presiding judge and James Tommaso is the clerk of course. Uh, they do have their USTA um, licenses in those particular fields. And um, even though they're new to the racing official list, uh, they have been, they're not new to us. They have been at Plain Ridge before. Um, and so I recommend that these, um, the list of these people be approved by the commission, of course, pending um, licensure by um, our licensing folks down there and um, completion of the background checks by the state police. Any questions for Dr. Lightbound or Dr. O'Toole? Do we need, do you need to have a refresher on the list or do you have those documents in front of you? I'm okay. happy to make a happy to make a motion, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I move that it, in accordance with 205 CMR 3.18, the commission approved the racing officials as requested and discussed here today, subject to licensure by the commission's racing division. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioner Skinner, this is new to you. Do you have any questions? I don't. I did get the opportunity to have some good um, uh, prep time with uh, Dr. Lightbound, so I am all good. Yeah. Okay, then we'll go ahead and, and Director O'Toole, we're excited about our upcoming season. Um, we'll take about Dr. Uh, direct, uh, my goodness, Commissioner Cameron. Thank you. Hi. Commissioner Bryan. Hi. Commissioner Hill. Hi. Mr. Skinner. Hi. And I vote yes, five zero. Excellent. What do you have next for us, Dr. Lightbound? 
the next item is the um, raver request of 205 CMR 312 number seven. Uh, this is the uh, qualifying time requirement. And right in the um, regulation, it does say that the association may request a waiver of this requirement. So uh, since uh, I believe, uh, let's see, was it 2018, um, Plain Ridge has, has asked for a waiver of this to move it from the 30 days to 45 days. Um, this still will um, ensure that the horses are fit and sound to race and give a line for um, the patrons to use. Um, but it will give um, the horsemen an, an extra 15 days uh, leeway. And so, um, and since this has been in effect, we haven't had any issues with it at all. So I am recommending that the commission grant this waiver. Any questions? Commissioner Cameron, you're nodding your head. You're familiar with this and the, the welfare of the horses. I, I believe we've made good decisions with this uh, waiver in the past. It served us well and uh, see no reason to change it at this time. Any questions on this? Okay. Commissioner, did I, I, I need a motion. I, I would make a motion. I realize, Dr. Lightbound, you can't move. I, I, <laughs> my apologies. We have her recommendation, Commissioner Hill. Uh, I would move that the commission waive the requirements set out in 205 CMR 3.12, subsection 7, that all horses not showing a satisfactory racing line during the previous 30 days go a qualifying mile in a race before the judges and change the 30-day period to 45 days for the reasons discussed here today. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Any questions now for either Director Tool or Dr. Lightbell? Okay. Commissioner Kim. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. Thank you. Okay. Next. Dr. Lightbell. Sure. So our next item is the uh, 2021 annual report, and I have uh, Chad Bork joining me today to help with this presentation. Um, I'm not going to go through in detail on it. You all have it in the packet, um, but just some touch on some highlights. Um, we were able to race a full meet in 2021, as you all know, in uh, 2020 with the um, COVID restrictions and all, we were shut down for many months. and. Um, that affected different things like number of races we could hold and the money that came in from the Racehorse Development Fund and all. Um, we had a great spirit of mass day with the Clara Barton Pace and the Burt Beckwith um, Memorial being brought back. And um, the chair and several of the commissioners came down for that day, it was wonderful. And um, Executive Director Wells. Um, and um, a couple of the, um, you know, our division has a number of dis different functions. Uh, one of the main ones is licensing. And so with the um, regular meet, we handled about the same number of licenses that we do. Um, the drug testing went back to similar um, levels from 2019. Um, we did have um, the trainers, if they have an adverse drug finding on one of their horses, they are um, entitled to a split sample. And we had two uh, trainers request splits this year and both of those were confirmed by the um, split lab, which goes to um, show once again, you know, the uh, credibility of the lab that we use that is accredited and all. Um, we have the investigative unit with the state police that works very closely with us on background checks and um, vehicle inspections and things like that. Um, our judging staff was busy. Um, there were no appeals of their decisions this past year, um, which uh, saves the commission a lot of time. Um, and on the financial end, um, with the chats, the primary one that um, does the reconciling of the handle figures and things like that. And he'll get into more detail on that. Um, we were able to distribute, uh, let's see, um, over $14 million in purses this year, which was a great amount you know, to, to get out to the horsemen. Um, the sire stakes program continues to improve with increasing number of horses. And um, just one note, um, Commissioner Skinner did notice some typos. And so um, if 
with the commission's okay, I'll work with her to um, correct the typos in the annual report before we put it onto our website as the official version. Um, and then just um, before I turn it over to Chad, I just wanted to thank Steve and his crew for their cooperation and help this year, as well as the horsemen and horsewomen. Um, it all is a uh, collaborative effort to get all the racing done and get all the different rules and all followed. Um, and I just want to mention again, uh, we can't do it with the racing division is a small unit. Uh, we can't do our um, jobs without the help of the other divisions of the MGC, um, the legal department, IT, uh, finance, um, HR, of course. Um, so I want to thank them. And then um, also the uh, leadership of um, Chair Judd Stein, the commissioners, and of course, uh, Executive Director Wells. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Chad to discuss the financial end of it. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Chad. Yes, good morning. Or are we at afternoon? It yet? is oh, still, still, I checked. It's still morning. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, that's good. Um, so as Alex mentioned, um, I'd like to um, just provide you with a quick summary of the division's financials and uh, we can do a little comparison from pre-pandemic levels and highlight a couple items. Uh, so to get right into it, um, I'll start with the division's revenue tax and fee receipts. So last year, the division collected over $328,000 in association license fees. Uh, we did 64,000 in badge and licensing license fees, just over 23,000 in penalties and fines collected and 750,000 um, in assessments. In total uh, for 2021, it came in at, and I'll give the exact figure, it's 2,215,932, I'm sorry, 2,215, uh, $1,932, and uh, this this represents a 7% increase year over year. Um, obviously, this increase is um, attributed or primarily attributed to the number of days the tracks were simply open compared to 20, 2020. Um, association fees, licensing fees, uh, live racing, the on-track simulcasting, um, we're all up uh, well above 2020 levels. So that's, um, uh, that's some good news there. And we should also see that happen in 2022. Um, and then to compare, I, I thought it would be interesting to compare uh, the 2021 handles uh, to the pre-pandemic level, um, which we were using 2019. So the live racing handle, um, We'll just take plain rage here. And 2019 was 1.4 million versus last year, uh, which was 1.17. Um, so there wasn't too much of a, a drop off in the live handle. And again, we should see that increase um, hopefully this year. The on track simulcasting, um, which our wagers placed at Plain Ridge, Raynham, Wonderland, and Suffolk. Uh, was 90 million in 2019 versus 65 million in 2021. So again, now that everyone's getting back to the tracks, um, you know, we hope to see that also increase. Um, the one of the bigger upticks was the six ADW providers, uh, who in 2019 did a handle of 121 million. Um, and this was, uh, in 2021, 212 million. So all told the commissionable handle total 213 million in 2019, uh, versus 278 million last year. So this represents, um, a, a 30% increase versus 2019. Um, so again, we should uh, 
we hope to see these numbers uh, continue to, to increase and uh, racing in the state is um, still still healthy and people are still uh, wagering on, on, uh, on, on the races. And then uh, lastly, we, uh, I think Alex mentioned, we distributed $16 million from the Racehorse Development Fund. Uh, this was to fund purse accounts and provide funding to the state's horsemen and horsewomen. And uh, there was a total of $1.6 million added to um, promo and uh, capital improvement trust funds. And also happy to report that we provided over $1.1 million in local aid. And uh, uh, just to echo uh, Alex sentiments, a big thank you to my colleagues at the racing division, uh, the finance team, and also representatives from, from our licensees who helped put this all together. And uh, that's the end of my report, unless there are any questions. Questions? Everyone's had the chance to go through the report. Thank you. I'm all set. Commissioners, you're all set. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Dr. Lightbound. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, before we move on, can I make a comment? Yes. I was, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I just, first of all, excellent report. I think we improve upon it every year, um, which is which is nice to see. It's um, encouraging to see all the numbers trending in the right direction. And I just, uh, I wanted to say that uh, I really have appreciated working with the racing division over the years, Mr. O'Toole, all the horsemen and women, and um, and to, you know, listen to this report and all the good work that's been done just brings back a lot of memories. Uh, Dr. Lightbound men mentioned the lab, the accredited lab, and it's just, you know, lots of good work over the years. So just a big thank you to the whole team. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron, your leadership and stewardship has not been lost on any of us in terms of the work with horse racing and I suspect it will probably be acknowledged a bit later. So thank you. I know you've also just really enjoyed it. It's a little bit contagious. Okay. Um, so, uh, Honestly, Alex, got to get back to my agenda here. But you're all set now. That's it concludes. So we don't, um, we won't be voting on your annual report, but I do want to echo Gail's um, uh, sentiments about the quality of the report. Thank you. Uh, it's very clear to me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be saving my um, comments for uh, Commissioner Cameron till later on in the uh, meeting. That's what I thought. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep on task right now. <laughs> okay, great. So this does um, conclude um, our item number five. And Crystal had anticipated that this would be a chance just for us to have a short break. And then we come back, Joe, uh, Chief Delaney, to your, your community mitigation work and, and, um, and then our, our bit of our, our tribute uh, before a lunch break. So we, we've got a lot to look forward to. Can I... Um, suggest a 15 minute break. So just around 12, 15, 12, 16. Does that work? Okay. Uh, Dave, David, you'll put on a, a screen saver and I will make sure not to leave the meeting. Thank you everyone.
Thanks, David. Where's my landline? I still don't know who calls. Um, I'm looking forward to being in the office. Let's see. Karen, are we pretty much set to start? Yep, uh, yep. we've got the community affairs. So Joe is uh, right on my top right hand screen. So I don't know where he is on yours. <laughs> yeah, I see Chief Delaney. Um, Joe, we don't have Mary, but is that okay? Or do we have Mary somewhere? There Where she is. is. I see her now. Yeah, I see her now. Okay. Um, all right. Then, commissioners, we'll get started. We're resuming. Um, I think today I started off the call the list the right way. Call to order. Um, my apologies, folks. You know, I don't think, Commissioner Cameron, I properly introduced today's public meeting, which has some import for you, number 375. So we're resuming public meeting number 375 again on March 31st, 2022. Good um, number to end on. I thought so. I think I had noted that before. Um, yeah, 375. And that doesn't include the agenda setting meetings and all the um, public hearings that you've attended. But it's kind of a good number. You'll remember it, right? Yeah, I um, will. I think that's right. So I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't note that, but we are we're re reconvening this meeting and we're going to start with our community affairs division. Uh, Chief Delaney, good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Today we have a couple of items up for you. Um, the first one is a Ludlow Reserve application. Um, and then the second items are the uh, workforce application from the 2022 uh, grant round. Um, so we'll start off first with Ludlow. Um, so Ludlow is a surrounding community to uh, Springfield. And if, um, if you're not familiar with the area exactly, Ludlow is located about Springfield to the north and west, uh, north and east, excuse me, of Springfield. Um, and they were designated a surrounding community. So they received a $100,000 reserve grant back in 2015. And as you recall, we, we told our, our um, grantees that they had to use, you know, come in and uh, with a proposal for their money before the end of 2021, uh, if they were going to be able to use that. Uh, Ludlow did come in with an application on the last day of 2021, so they were timely. Uh, and I think as we mentioned, uh, at least at the agenda setting meeting, uh, that this somehow wound up in a junk folder. So it, it sat there for some period of time uh, before we found it. Um, so we apologize to the, to the folks in Ludlow on, uh, on not acting on this uh, a bit more timely. Um, but anyway, uh, Ludlow is uh, asking for some, some general traffic uh, safety equipment uh, for their police department that consists primarily of cameras. These are trailer mounted cameras, um, as well as message boards and speed boards, things of that nature. Um, now, in, in the location where Ludlow is, the original environmental impact report did indicate that about 1% of the traffic would go, would use the local streets through Springfield to access uh, Ludlow. Um, and in addition, I-90 does pass through Ludlow and there's an exit right there. 
um, off of I-90 into into Ludlow. So there's you know other traffic that's that's using that's going through Ludlow as well. Um, so we felt that again with the uh, reserves. Um, you know, we, we have uh, sort of said that there, there, there are impacts there, but, you know, this sort of defines that there definitely are some traffic impacts. And we think it's reasonable to expect that the police department in Ludlow will uh, come across uh, patrons and employees of the casino from time to time, and that, that this type of uh, use is appropriate. So, we are recommending uh, that staff uh, approve this request for $100,000 as outlined in the application. And um, if it is approved by the commission, then we will uh, execute the necessary grant agreement with Ludlow uh, to make that happen. So I, I will open this one up for any questions from the commission. Commissioner's questions for um, Joe or Mary. Yes, Commissioner Cameron. Nope, not a question. It just uh, I do agree with this um, recommendation. Um, the the the, the um, traffic safety equipment in question is really valuable, and um, there is an impact. They've made that clear, and, and training for their officers is another really valuable um, way to use this money. So I'm just in full agreement with the recommendation of staff on this issue. Any further questions or comments? I'm glad that we found it. It's a lesson. All of us need to be checking that junk um, drawer. Uh, I think um, over the last year, I've, I've had this happen a few times to Mary and, and Joe. So um, I'm really glad that we were able to, to accommodate this now. Great, uh, great memorandum. <clears throat> There's no further questions. You do need a vote. I have a motion. Right. Um, Madam Chair, I move that uh, the commission approve the town of Ludlow's request to use its $100,000 of rever reserve funds to purchase general traffic safety equipment and training for police officers in the use of the equipment as described in the memo in the commissioner's packet and as discussed here today and that commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating this award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. I think we have a, um, was that from Commissioner Skinner? Is that okay, Commissioner O'Brien? We'll have Commissioner Skinner right. seconded. Thank you. Um, I just wanna note, uh, good work, Mary. I know that you really, um, followed through with all of the communities to, to see that they could, could get the uh, full use of these reserve funds. So great work and, and they did meet the deadline. So excellent. Okay, any other um, edits on the motion or anything? All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Hill. Aye. And Commissioner Skinner. <clears throat> Aye. I vote yes. Five zero. Excellent. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Um, so next up, we have the 2022 workforce applications uh, for your consideration. Um, as you may recall, when the guidelines were developed in the fall, we increased the amount of money for workforce uh, grants from $800,000 to a million, 500,000 out in the West and 500,000 in the East. Um, so we did receive just a single application from the West and from the East. Um, and uh, so I guess we'll, the first one we'll, we'll take up is the uh, Holyoke Community College, the Work Ready uh, 2022 application. Uh, so on this one, uh, we've been funding uh, Holyoke uh, Community College and their partners for the last several years. Um, you know, essentially what we have found uh, through the pandemic and otherwise, that the casinos still have a difficult time attracting qualified uh, applicants for, the, for, for work in their, in their facilities. And that has particularly affected the um, the hospitality uh, industry, uh, finding people for restaurants, hotels, things of that nature. So um, 
So there clearly is still a need from the casinos and of course from the other industries, uh, the other uh, uh, businesses in the area that hire those same type of folks. Uh, so, you know, there clearly is a connection to the casino on these and there clearly is a need. So, um, you know, we still uh, continue to fund these. So just as a, a quick rundown, uh, on Holyoke Co Community College. So their partners are Springfield Technical Community College and Springfield Public Schools. So Springfield uh, Technical Community College will continue their Hamden Prep uh, project, which emphasizes job readiness and entry level skills um, and uh, increasing comprehension, math skills, things of that nature. Um, Springfield Public Schools will continue their ahead of the game, which really focuses on advancing students to adult basic education courses so that they can get their high school diploma. And as you know, uh, all employees of uh, MGM uh, and Encore require at least a high school diploma uh, to work at those facilities. So that is still a very important piece of the puzzle here, especially out in Springfield. Uh, getting people to get their GEDs or, or HiSET or um, other uh, equivalency to a high school diploma. And then, of course, Hamden Prep will, con will continue uh, their culinary school, uh, which has uh, proven to be very valuable for MGM as a, as a pipeline for people to work in their restaurants and so on. But again, always uh, a challenge to get enough people in to get them trained and to get them uh, through the process. So on that one, I will stop here um, if you have any questions around that one in particular. And also uh, Crystal Howard is here. She did the initial reviews for us on these applications as she has done uh, in the last several years working with us on, on the, particularly on the workforce applications. Excellent. And uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Crystal, uh, for your work on this, Mary and Lily. Uh, questions on this particular, we, we would probably look at them separately for a vote, but why don't we, are there any particular questions on either program? Okay, well then why don't I, um, we can either vote on the first one or I can go through the second one and then we can do the second one. Right, okay. so I think, um, do you wanna, do we wanna pause now? That was really my question or okay. hear from this. Let's hear the second one. I think that makes sense, okay? Okay. Thank you. So the other application for the Eastern part of the state is the Metro Boston Regional Gaming Hospitality Consortium, which just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> um, and that is, uh, a joint venture between Mass Hire, Metro North, and the city of Boston, and a number of other partners, I might add. Um, again, we're recommending full funding for the $500,000 for this application. Um, and similar to the, the, uh, the HCC application, we have been funding this for several years now. And again, in our conversations with Encore about what their needs are uh, for hiring, you know, their answer was we need everyone. Um, but, you know, again, the culinary and hospitality and things of that nature are um, a little more um, difficult to, to, to fill. Um, so in this, again, we're, we're, we're doing the same types of things, um, providing, you know, English for speakers of other languages, occupational skills, digital literacy, career counseling, um, you know, this is a little different than the, the one out west, which is being run by a community college. Um, you know, the, the um, I guess the, the workforce development uh, infrastructure is a little more well developed in Eastern Mass, where um, these folks are trying to partner with a bunch of existing agencies that can really target some very specific things. Um, you know, and some of the things, some of the folks that we have, you know, working on this one is the uh, Boston Education Skills and Training, which is known as BEST. Um, so there, they will continue their hospitality and housekeeping pre-apprentice program. Um, you know, we have, uh, uh, let's see, there's the uh, Community Work Service, um, who is a new partner in here. Um, 
that will that, that they're including an environmental cleaning and building and grounds training, which is something that's new to the program for this year. Um, we also have um, what's known as Ready Set Ready Set Serve, which is the uh, International Institute of New England is providing that training. Um, also, a, a culinary specialization program from the the YMCA of Greater Boston. So they found a, a whole bunch of partners here to work with where, you know, people come in looking for work and they can be targeted, you know, they can determine what, what their interests are and send them to the right place to get the right training for, you know, what type of job it is that they're, they're looking for, you know, particularly um, in the casino industry and, and the, the, the hospitality industry. So uh, again, a great uh, proposal, a little different from last year, a few new partners from last year, but essentially uh, trying to provide the same uh, training to those groups that, that would, would work in the uh, hospitality industry. And so with that, I guess I will open that up for questions. And a reminder that we had approved for the two east and west, each up to 500,000, right? Yes, that's correct. Yep, we're recommending each one for five hundred thousand dollars on on uh, for this year. Oh, and just one other thing that I, I meant to mention at the beginning: um, we have moved these uh, up to the very beginning of our our approvals, and the particular reason for that is is and it's more for I think Holyoke Community College uh, more so than uh, in the east. But they work strictly on a on a state fiscal year, which starts July one and ends uh, June 30th. And um, we are trying to be responsive to that so that if we approve these right up front, we, we still have quite a bit of work getting documents together, getting the grant agreements together and the contracts and the ISAs and so on. And it's our goal is to not just have these things approved by the end of June, but to have all of the paperwork, all of the approvals in place before the start of the fiscal year so we can work better with their uh, their cadence on how on how they they put these projects out. Excellent, commissioners. Questions on these the two proposals now. I have a quick question. Sure, commissioner. Um, actually, when uh, I was sitting down with the team to go over these uh, a few weeks ago, um, it really sounds like they're doing the job that you know the money was intended to. To, uh, to go to it, but my question to Joe would be, so we've given um, both of these entities money in the past. So have we heard where there have been workers that have been hired by the casinos? Are, are we seeing those employees that we're funding actually get jobs at the casinos? Oh yeah, certainly. Um, you know, and I think, you know, part of this is also though to sort of backfill jobs that might be that might be lost to the casino. You know, some of the casino jobs are much higher paying than some of the other facilities. So if there's someone who has some experience and can go work at the casino, we're also looking at these as, as training someone to backfill that job that might've been lost to the casino. But yeah, um, Crystal, I don't know if you have any statistics particularly on that. I know they do report, um, you know, their statistics on how many people have been trained and hired and so on. Yeah, I would. I was going to say I would have to pull. I mean, I can certainly for you um, for the future pull up some of that reporting. But they do report quarterly, and it's extensive reporting. We ask for everything from um, you know general statistics and ethnicities and minorities, supplier. You know, just every every aspect of this is part of it. But even going forward this year, there there was an element of that that we recommended that they make sure they do report on that pipeline. But it takes time, right? So they put, even report out six months from when a person's placed what their salary average is so that we can see these are livable wages. Um, but that is definitely a component of the reporting. It just takes them longer to get that back. And, and because of the nature of the turnover, it's often difficult to tell to who stayed and whatnot. So, but we do have data on that um, and we could, I could pull together. Something for you to see that. I have no problem with this uh, moving forward, but it would be nice to have that information. Yeah, Jill, uh, I'd love to build on this even more. It's going to be one of my suggestions is um, I think Crystal giving us those reports are really important. I'm wondering, Joe, if, if um, once it makes sense from a timing perspective, um, if we could have these, these two um, applicants 
come and do a presentation for us. I'm really interested on hearing about the impact of COVID and where they are, and it would really personalize this, um, uh, these two grants. We've had in the past, uh, Commissioner Hill and Commissioner Skinner, the opportunity, as I have, to, to see these at work by going, and you've gone to Commissioner O'Brien and you're nodding your head. Now, we couldn't do that in the last two years to visit um, uh, the programs, but that's something we can look forward to. But I do think it would be also nice if they presented at a public meeting because it's it's so relevant right now, right, Commissioner Hill? Yes, um, actually, um, Mary had brought that up that the commissioners might be interested in making some of those site visits again, which would be great. We used to do that in the past, as you've seen. So we certainly can program that. And they have, both entities have um, come before us in the past to give an update, but it's been quite a while. So I think that'd be really in, in this, in the nature of today's workforce needs to um, be really informative. Yeah, and so I think- and I, know, and I know they would be happy to come in. Uh, we've had some you know, recent conversations with them and, and these people are really, really, really into what they do. And I, I think they would love to talk about it. <laughs> Does that, does that help, Commissioner Hill? Yes. Thank Great. You. And, 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 uh, and then, uh, Crystal, to add to your workload, I think those, that reporting will be great. We can, um, we can get those stats and then bring in all the, the other elements to a good presentation to add to Mary's workload. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Any further questions? Excellent question, Commissioner Hill. I would be more than happy to make uh, a motion for the Holyoke Community College grant. Thank you. We're going to do them separate, correct? I think separate is the right yes. way to go. Mm -hmm. yep. So I um, I would move that the commission approve the Holyoke Community College's request for five hundred thousand dollars from the Community Mitigation Fund to continue the previously funded Work Ready program, which is intended to. Um, to upskill the local workforce and close educational gaps and that the commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating this award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. Any questions, edits, comments? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Hill. Aye. And Commissioner Skinner. Aye. I vote yes. Five zero. Thank you. Excellent work. And, and thank you to uh, Holyoke Community College. Do I have another motion? Um, Madam Chair, I can move for the Eastern Region. I move that the Commission approve Mass Hire Metro North and the City of Boston's request for $500,000 from the Community Mitigation Fund to continue the Metro Boston Regional Gaming and Hospitality Consortium Grant Programming, which is designed to assist local unemployed and underemployed individuals with an interconnected pipeline of services via several community partners in Greater Boston, and that the Commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating this award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. All right, any further questions on this one? I think it's an interesting consortium. Um, okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. And Commissioner Skinner. Aye. I vote yes, five zero. Thank you, uh, Joe, uh, Chief Delaney, excellent work, and, and the team, Mary and Lily and Crystal, thank you for your con continuing con contribution on this, so thank you. Thank you. It, that concludes always, our report. It feels good to, to start this process, Joe, thank you. And, and Brad, I know you've been so involved. It's um, community mitigation grant. It's um, a just it's a very rewarding process. and and fulfillment of the vision. So thank you, Joe. Well done. All right, now we're turning to our commission updates. Um, we're gonna start with the annual report and before I turn it over to Crystal, 
I want to acknowledge that in the past, this had been commissioner driven. Um, and then, of course, the team was very involved and, and supported, was, I think, Commissioner Zuniga, who pretty much managed that for years. Um, I got clever and decided to ask a member of our team to help us on this. Uh, it's a big process and it takes the village and all of the team made their contributions and directed them to Crystal. And you know, Crystal worked with them and Crystal also worked with the printer and all of us commissioners. You really made it a collaborative effort, but Crystal, your individual work should be honored and acknowledged here. And for that, we are very thankful. I like it, it's crisp, it's clear, the language is accessible, um, it feels modern. Uh, so, uh, and it's got some of your touches that you bring um, to us as your program manager skill set and beyond. So thank you. Um, I wanna have you present it now. It is not uh, commissioners in the public packet, uh, this gives us a chance to discuss it, and then it will be launched publicly when it's in its very final form. Um, and I welcome suggestions on that too, right, on distribution. Uh, that's something that you can even work individually with Crystal on ideas. Commissioner Cameron, maybe before you, you leave, you can think about that too, because you've had the experience of seeing where it goes. I know, uh, Todd, we are required to get it out and that's acknowledged in the uh, document itself to certain parties, but um, there are others who may be interested. So, so a big, um, a big uh, expression of gratitude to you, Crystal. And uh, why don't you, why don't you talk about it now? Great, thank you, Chair. Um, that's very kind of you. It really did take a village and I think you guys have heard that I actually did enjoy doing it. So, I mean, that makes it a lot easier, right? But, um, as you all have seen, I did uh, receive and release the final draft of our 21, it's our fiscal year 21 report to all of you. I've heard just um, some great feedback and just a couple very minor edits, a comma, you know, comma here, asterisk here. So I think it looks like otherwise um, we're with those few edits and I'm more than willing to take any other feedback as well. It looks like we might be in a great place for looking toward that um, approval, finalization, or release of the report to our officials, legislators, and the public. And of course, I am developing a list. So if you have any recommendations or suggestions, I would love to hear that um, as I put together an actual distribution list. And I have been working um, and will continue to work further too with our communications team, obviously. So um, I welcome any additional comments and or your approval today so we can roll that out. Mr. Cameron, you've seen many interrupt inter 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 I can't say the word um, of the of um, this report. What do you think? Well, I was remembering our first one, how we were scrambling to just get something on paper because we didn't have a lot of staff, and uh, we we were just you know we had done some work that first wor uh, year, but not the kind of work uh, that is um, typically in an annual report. So I have seen uh, many versions, um, but but. This was a great idea to have uh, Crystal and her skills kind of take this, as she pointed out, because when we chatted about this in the office, I don't know, last week, the week before, we said, oh, my God, thank you. This is a this is a project. And she said, no, 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 I love doing this. So <laughs> I was surprised and pleased, obviously, because um, the effort, it really does show that you love doing the work because it's excellent. It's um, I agree with you that it is not too wordy. Uh, lots of great pictures to kind of just liven it up and make the point and demonstrate what's been done this year. You know, the picture does speak about so many good things. I loved all the racing pictures. Um, so I, I thought it was an excellent report. And, um, um, you know, I'm just, uh, it's again, it's progress. It's us moving forward as an organization Everything we do, we try to do it a little better. And that's something I'm very proud of. And I just want to thank the whole team because I know, Crystal, you spearheaded the effort, but we don't do a thing at this commission without the team, do we? It's just the way we operate. So so thanks very much. And uh, I really love the report. Well done. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? I, I love the numbers page, right? 
That's a, a, a really a clever addition. Uh, Commissioner Hill? <coughs> Sorry, guys. <coughs> Commissioner Hill? Oh, I think it's an excellent uh, report. Uh, I was in contact with Crystal throughout the entire process. I uh, gave her my suggestions and thank you for accept accepting them. Uh, you've done yeoman's work on this and you're to be congratulated as has the entire team uh, giving you the information that you needed for this report. It looks great. So I'm more than happy to move it forward today. Thank you. Yeah, everyone was really um, good when, you know, going back and forth. It, it was definitely a team effort. But... Love the pictures. Yeah. Those are sometimes the hardest to get because, you know, I have to work with the licensees too. And it's like, we want fresh stuff, but that comes from my market in, in the back. But, you know, it was a tough year for us to get photos. And we weren't, you know, the FY21 was through June of um, last year. So we were still in flux and we do have a lot of great, uh, really great photos this year. So I was excited about that. But thank you to Play My Way uh, and everybody over on the gaming floor and racing is it was just really what do you have please give me anything and dave uh, i know he's not here somewhere just really honing that um we, we have a drop box for this which i could not imagine that i'm managing and just me please take all these photos and put them somewhere so that the designer can later get them so he was really fabulous for that so it really was a team the pictures really captured all the facilities like i'm looking as at the uh, horse racing pictures um, which are just phenomenal. No, great job. Well, you guys can take your own when you're out there next week, right? And make sure I get those. <laughs> we're next year's report. No, we luckily have great racing photographers, so we're set. Okay, so um, I think that we decided that it makes sense, uh, Todd, for us to approve this because it is statutorily required, right? Uh, so I think we should um, move on it. Commissioner Skinner, you did point out that um, this did come to you rather late, um, but not because of Crystal. That came through the printer and she offered it for distribution to us on Monday. And I, I, um, I thought that it made great sense to, to uh, vote on this today because at the very least, three commissioners we knew um, would be able to have a quorum. And Commissioner Hill, I think you feel comfortable with your review. And so Commissioner Skinner, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, if you want to add in now. I, I plan to abstain from voting to approve. Yeah, I bet you will have time to flip through this and enjoy it. And it will inform your review of the next one, which Crystal is really also working to get us back onto the right um, cadence. And so before we know it, we'll have um, fiscal year 22, right, Crystal? Um, and we're hoping for the- A few what short months away. <laughs> uh, and I let Commissioner Skinner know that we I will be just digging right in with her on that, so. That she did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but before, have time. Before, before she can even pause. But the great news is that you've got this experience and you'll be able to um, to work on this. So, and that will get us because the deadline is, is it October or is it December? Um, I believe it's November, oh. actually. I didn't get it right at all. Right in I? between there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have. I had it up earlier, but yeah, it's it's right in that time frame. It, it might even yeah. it might be right, it might be late October. And I think we've always kind of started it just a little bit. It takes longer. It takes longer than well, it and, and also you know working remotely, we we were a little stalled and we're all catching up. Yeah. and in this you know yeah exactly in this year it was it was more of you know a lot of times it's let's put a look at what happened last year and and see how we can just tweak that and it wasn't quite that type of scenario this time because COVID, the previous year's report was so focused on COVID and our and the, the licensees having to shut down and how all of our transitions changed. So it clearly was really, had to be redeveloped. So it definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get it up. We're going to look for it going now. Commissioner O'Brien, are you on set? I am. I'm still processing that, you know, Crystal enjoyed the experience because I- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
So I, I had to do sort of divisions in other offices that I was responsible for. And I, I helped Enrique a little bit on the one right before he left. So my hat is off to you, Crystal. That you enjoyed that experience. I'm glad to hear it since you'll be doing it going forward. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. You want to make a motion? If you have it or somebody. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the annual report of the commission's activities presented and discussed here today with the agreed upon any, any agreed upon amendments. I don't believe there were any. Um, and authorize commission staff to submit the report to the officials identified in MGL chapter 23K section 70. Second. Okay. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. And Commissioner Skinner. Abstain. And I vote yes, so four yeses and an abstention. We look forward to um, the next report, but we look forward to the finalization of this one. And so pleased um, that we could conclude uh, that annual report on Commissioner Cameron's last day. Um, thank you. Thank you, Crystal, for, for orchestrating all of that. Um, next year, uh, Commissioner Cameron, you'll be in the farewell section. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You don't get out of it fully. <laughs> I like the SFI. Just I'm following you. As long as you keep my 10 year old picture, I'm okay. <laughs> it's, it is a nice picture, Commissioner Cameron. I don't think I've seen you take a bad one. Um, so um, I, I want to now shift um, gears. Uh, you've had some really good work done and a little bit of laughter and a lot of accolades um, um, in terms of the work that's been performed by our team. Um, I want to thank Tom Mills, I'm calling him Mills now, who's out in Springfield working with Mark Vanderlinden on Play My Way. Um, he really has been important in, in uh, helping us think about how to give a proper tribute to Commissioner uh, Cameron. So uh, we do have a little bit of a run of show, Commissioner Cameron, so there's some, some order. Uh, you probably will forgive me for that. Um, but I want to say uh, publicly, today's public meeting marks a bittersweet occasion where we do say goodbye to and celebrate the contributions of our colleague, Commissioner Gail Cameron. Commissioner Cameron is finishing her second five-year term, a term that began at the outset of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission being established. One of the first five appointed commissioners and the first woman commissioner, Gail has helped to shape and build the gaming industry here in Massachusetts. I recall personally when Attorney General Martha Coakley publicly announced her intent to appoint Gail to the position of commissioner. For me, it was newsworthy and noteworthy. You see, the gaming industry across the country has not always been well represented by women. Massachusetts has trended differently. We are a commission today of four women and one man with our team led by our executive director, Karen Wells, and the IEB under the direction of Director Loretta Williams. That is exceptional. And I'm quite convinced it is a tribute to Commissioner Cameron's trailblazing. For that, Gail, I am forever grateful. We at the MGC and the Commonwealth have been the beneficiaries of Gail's depth and expertise in public safety. Her experience as Deputy Superintendent for the New Jersey State Police, the second highest rank on the force, has worked to inform her work here at the Commission particularly as we consider the impact of gambling on public safety, a record right now that I know Commissioner Cameron, you're extremely proud of. All of us extend our sincere gratitude for your past service as a law enforcement officer. Commissioner Cameron also has been instrumental in critical reforms regarding horse racing and has served as a key voice in partnership with Dr. Lightbound always for the horse racing program. And since Commissioner Zuniga's departure, Gail accepted our appointment of her as treasurer, giving her an opportunity these last few months to work with CFAO Derek Lennon and his finance team. A new opportunity that I thank her 
for embracing even at the conclusion of her long tenure here. There are many examples that I could offer that illustrate Gail's steadfast leadership and the wealth of experience she brought to her role as commissioner, helping to build the team that I know she's terribly proud of and lend support to MGC's development. I wanna make sure to give all of our colleagues the chance to share their accolades today. Um, we're gonna allow for plenty of time to do so. But in my role personally, I have looked to Gail, usually right here in this public forum, given the restrictions of the open meeting law for insights on past practices and institutional knowledge to help me make my best judgments and informed decisions. Those contributions will continue on even after today's meeting. Gail, you have much to be proud of as to your legacy here. You have inspired many of your colleagues at all levels of the commission over the course of your 10 years. I wish you the very best as you move on to your next act and I'm confident that you will have many. And Jeff and I wish you and Judy the very best of health and much happiness well into the future. Now I'll turn to my fellow commissioners to say a few words. We're gonna start with Commissioner O'Brien. Yep, um, I still can't believe Gail's actually leaving. I walked into her office and saw the empty walls today and I, it was pretty jarring to see everything bare. I knew it was coming, I guess I was in denial about it. The idea that, um, you know, Gail was the first person from the commission, the first commissioner to reach out to me when I was appointed um, and what was sort of a, haphazard introduction she really was the one who made sure I knew you know where I was going and, and what I needed to ask and where to go she took me down to PPC I saw the racing team and went down there saw the count room for the first time and how much cash was flowing through there to get an appreciation for um, what this job was in terms of what we were overseeing um, while we had similar backgrounds you know she had far more experience than I did in gaming and you know some of the nitty-gritty in terms of the community mitigation grants and things like that. Um, she is a force to be reckoned with, um, not only here within the commission, but um, on the golf course. Um, I remember trying to play once with her and she kept trying to change the rules to make it more equitable for my lack of skills. And I finally just was like, enough, let's just stick with best ball and call it a day. Because <laughs> I could not keep up with how quick her mind was working to try to make it an equal, uh, an equal task. But, um, I have very much appreciated um, the professional guidance and the support you've given me, I, again, from that first phone call when I came here, um, sitting next to you and the win hearing stand, I, I felt like we were jumping over each other sometimes to get the same kind of question out. Um, but even then, a slightly different perspective that was always appreciated. Um, I felt supported all the time in my role as commissioner and as individually as a woman in this industry and moving forward. Um, you are the last woman standing from the originals. Um, again, I, I can't believe this time has come. I know you're looking forward to going back in to retirement, but as Kathy said, I can't imagine you actually fully retired. So whether we see you here or we hear about you doing something else, um, I, I hope you stay in touch, um, not only with the commission, but me personally, you still owe me another round of golf. Um, just need to give me a little time to get out there and dust off the clubs to do it. But I look forward to raising a glass tonight. Um, thank you again for everything and I wish you well. So next on the list is, uh, I believe, Commissioner Hill. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Gail, I'm gonna miss you. I think when I, I, I said to her this morning, folks, I said, how am I gonna say anything nice about you? But then I started thinking about the things I would say. And we had a good laugh about that. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about your longevity here at the Mass Gaming Commission. Uh, you, it's already been said by Commissioner O'Brien, the last woman standing. But your longevity to me has proven your dedication and more importantly, the love that you have for this agency in so many ways. Your experience in New Jersey has been invaluable in creating a strong commission. Uh, more importantly is your ability to share your opinions in a blunt but compassionate way that has uh, been adopted through the agency, ensuring the agency continues to be a leader in this industry, not just nationally, 
but internationally. And on a personal note, I, I will miss your institutional knowledge as well uh, of this house that you helped build. And of course, the wisdom you have offered me over the last few months um, has been incredible. Your knowledge of horse racing and your willingness to share with me that knowledge has allowed me to better understand the industry and to make me a better commissioner. And lastly, uh, what I will miss is the great stories and experiences that you shared with me from your time in New Jersey. Um, the stories I learned uh, from you, uh, which helped you know, me get a better understanding of how some of our own departments here work. And I truly appreciate all of that. And Eileen, although I have not had the opportunity to go out and play golf, I have been offered to go out and play golf. So I'm looking forward uh, to doing that with you, Gail, in retirement. I too will need the rules changed as I um, am not the best golfer and I hear you are very, very, very good. Uh, and I will also miss our before meeting sport updates um, because I don't have too many people that I can talk sports with anymore. So uh, in the household, so I appreciated uh, those conversations. Uh, you have been so good for the Mass Gaming Commission. You are gonna be missed. And I certainly will miss again, all of the um, great stories, but more importantly, the wisdom that you shared with us all throughout your tenure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, in particular for indulging me earlier, I wasn't gonna let the chance to second a motion made by the last original commissioner pass me by. <laughs> um, so I, first met Commissioner Cameron um, outside of the virtual public meetings uh, in September last year. We were at the IAGRA conference and she invited me to take a seat at the table for lunch. No big deal, right? Except that it was the very first impersonal social interaction I had had with colleagues since I started uh, at MGC remotely, let alone a commissioner. So as you can probably imagine, I had a lot of warming up to do, getting used to being uh, around people again, really. Um, but Commissioner Cameron made it painless. She was easy to talk to, very lighthearted. Um, and I got my first taste of her master storytelling ability. Um, so fast forward to just a couple of weeks ago and a lot of funny stories later, I was preparing to be sworn in as commissioner, and I got the opportunity to spend more time with Commissioner Cameron as we uh, visited the three licensees. Um, and getting to the point of the kind of person she is, I was struck by her genuine patience and kindness. Um, there wasn't a person she encountered that she felt wasn't deserving of a few minutes to check in with, to ask about family, to thank them for their contributions, to tell a joke to, or just to say hello. From casino personnel, gaming agents, the GEU team, even casino patrons, there was really no ranking in who she you know, chose to give her time and attention to. Um, and having been on the receiving end of that kind of attention back at the conference, I know firsthand how they all felt. Um, Commissioner Cameron is very supportive very encouraging, and just an overall wonderful human being. Uh, so Commissioner Cameron, thank you for seeing me. Thank you for seeing others. And most of all, thank you for your long list of accomplishments and contributions to this body, to the Gaming Commission and the industry as a whole. What an example you have set. Um, congratulations on your retirement. This is not goodbye. This is more for me, um, just to talk to you later. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Commissioner Cameron, we're not gonna let you speak yet. I'm on task. Um, we really, we really wanted to make this a, a nice day. And I do love Judy. Thank you for turning on your videos. Team, if you would like to turn on your videos, we don't care. Um, I haven't been able to shampoo my hair for weeks, so uh, welcome aboard. Uh, we'd love to see your faces.
Okay. Um, and I do think yeah. some folks are watching on the live stream, uh, Madam Chair, so I they see. may not be on this. So I think other people okay, are watching. Okay, that's, and that's great. That's great too. Um, but tune in because we, we will have the opportunity for you to speak uh, to Commissioner Cameron. But right now, I want to turn it, of course, to Karen. Thank you. So, Gail, uh, as other folks have said, this is a bittersweet moment. You are the last of the original Fab Five to leave. Um, you are the first and only commissioner to do the full five, pardon me, full 10 year term. So, thank you for the, that decade of admirable service to the Commonwealth and to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Um, I was thinking about what I'd say this morning and um, it is, it's a tough goodbye because you have been a true leader in this organization. Uh, you, as folks have said, you have done it with humor and some good stories. And what I wanted to focus on this morning was also uh, the friendship, not only to myself, but other members of this organization. Uh, I can think I can speak on behalf of the staff that we appreciated our, your loyalty and your dedication to all the people that work here um, and your interaction on a personal level, going around to folks in the office, chatting with people, seeing how they were doing, finding out what's really going on and uh, not only on the substantive issues, but on also the issues that uh, folks are dealing with in their personal lives and in their day-to-day -day business. So. I wanna thank you for that. You have been exemplary, particularly in the areas of horse racing and getting up to speed there. I know in the beginning, um, you didn't really have a background in horse racing and you raised your hand and you volunteered to learn all about it and work with Alex. And I know Alex is eternally grateful for your support in that area. Uh, and also the investigations as, um, as the former head of the IEB, uh, I wanna thank you for all your contributions in that area and the leadership uh, in that area and public safety. Um, and then a little more humorous note the level, um, you know, you're also got a great strength of character. So I just wanna share something with folks that I think uh, nobody wants to be on the other end of this look. And I'm hoping that was a licensee <laughs> maybe or a presenter rather than staff. But I share that just because A, it is amusing, but also, um, you really were not afraid to make the tough calls. You know, you, you have a real uh, determination, strength of purpose and strength of character. And so for that, I really wanna thank you uh, for showing that to everyone. And uh, the commissioners, um, as you know, we do these certificates of appreciation and certain language in there. So check with the, all the commissioners on that language. I just wanna read that out loud and, and we'll discuss the, the format of getting that to you later. But it reads, on this 31st day of March, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission proudly presents this Distinguished Service Award to Gail Cameron in grateful appreciation for her service to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As a founding member of the MGC, Commissioner Cameron was instrumental in successfully building a new and sustainable public agency while simultaneously implementing a multifaceted expanded gaming law. She utilized her investigatory and leadership skills in a role as commissioner, developed an expertise in horse racing regulation and supported equity and inclusion both in the MGC and the gaming industry as a whole. A person of genuine character and integrity, she was resolute in her decision-making and a strong advocate for integrating the commission's values into all areas of gaming regulation. The MGC extends its heartfelt gratitude for her immeasurable contributions, consummate professionalism, and admirable dedication to public service. Her decency, friendship, and humor will always be remembered. Thank you. And thank you to Dave for putting the little slideshow together and putting that up. So thank you, Commissioner Cameron. I'll turn it back over to the chair. Commissioner Cameron, did you love those? There were probably 4 million that we could have chosen, but the uh, timing was perfect, by the way. Yeah, that worked out. Thank you, it Dave. Really worked out. <laughs> yeah, um, that, uh, definitely a, a little bit of a snapshot. Um, now we'd like to be able to, to hear from uh, different staff members. Um, and 
I'm, I'm going to see who wants to lean in first um, to share some light. Perhaps I'll turn to uh, Director Lilios. Here's, there you go. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. And hi, Commissioner Cameron. I wouldn't want the uh, afternoon to go by without expressing my thanks uh, to you, but I'm going to keep it very brief uh, because so much has already been acknowledged from that you know, really genuine warmth of personality that you express to uh, have expressed to me and that I've seen you express to uh, others, both on the staff and outside of the staff, um, to your master storytelling ability that uh, is a real gift. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for myself personally and uh, professionally for your support, uh, for your insights, for being a wonderful role model, uh, and from for the uh, amazing camaraderie uh, over these years. I really look up to you um, and uh, look forward to continuing a uh, connection with you and just wanna thank you for, for everything uh, on behalf of myself and the IEP. Okay, raise hands or lean in. You want, if you would like to, I know Dr. I see, can I? Can I go to Steve O'Toole? Because I see he's here and I suspect he would like to, to comment. Well, <clears throat> I would. There's not a lot, lot that I can say um, that hasn't already been said. So I'll say the things that I can say that haven't been said. Um, yeah, I, I met Gail when she was first put on the commission. Uh, she was, you know, when the commission was form, you know, forming, uh, we went through the application process. Her and I rode the front seat of the Plain Ridge roller coaster back then. Um, I'm sure she remembers that well. And I got that look more than anyone probably at the commission level. Uh, that is the look that uh, you don't want to get. And I got that more than once. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when we were very elated when we got the award of the class two license, um, there was a point in time when it was 100, the odds were probably 100 to one that I would still be here uh, outlasting Gail. <laughs> uh, but uh, I am, and I thank her. her. Uh, she's one of the people that I can thank for that. Uh, you know, we had the ribbon cutting that we, uh, that we did. She was here throughout the building process of the casino, which we were both very involved with. Um, and just her, it, it's been mentioned about her racing, uh, taking the bull by from day one, uh, doing, doing hearings on her, uh, you know, uh, on her own. Um, uh, the annual licensing that we were going through in the early days and just her guidance and leadership on the, uh, on all the, uh, you know, on all the uh, racing issues. So I look forward to uh, meeting up with you, Gail, at the East Bay Grill sometime soon and uh, going over some of those uh, old stories. Uh, congratulations. And uh, you know, we love you here. I'm just going to turn it on for a minute. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you staying through our meeting to make some kind remarks. So thanks very much. We will meet up at these big roles. <laughs> Alex, do you want to speak now? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I still remember like it was yesterday uh, that we were over at the Division of Professional Licensure. The racing State Racing Commission had ended up there. And um, we got the word that uh, Commissioner Cameron had been appointed. We were very impressed by her resume, um, raising to the highest rank, second highest rank in the state police in New Jersey, and that she had the interest in racing and was going to be working with us. Uh, she stepped right in and came out to the field um, to see what we needed um, to help us uh, regulate better. And uh, really appreciate her jumping right in on that. Um, I had worked for the State Racing Commission for about 20 years at that point and never had a woman commissioner. So Gail was my first woman commissioner and I really appreciated that. And I'm glad to see that um, that is continuing on with the Gaming Commission. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of the Racing Division, I'd like to thank Gail for everything she's done for us. Um, she 
uh, remember how much she enjoyed coming on the roof at the tracks, the, the judges stand and the stewards stand, um, overlooking the tracks and hearing the different comments from the commissioners on the horsemen and all. Um, she had a wonderful, genuine uh, understanding of how enthusiastic the horsemen and horsewomen are about um, their professions and um, how the um, tracks themselves work with the horsemen. Um, I really appreciated her dedication, um, her also her excitement about the possibility of a new thoroughbred track. We have um, listened to a lot of different groups that have had ideas and um, she's always been so enthusiastic about that. Um, I don't have much else to say other than I'll miss um, Gail's enthusiasm, her guidance and her laughter and I wish you all the best Gail. Mm -hmm. I think uh, oh, uh, yeah, I see Todd, I see Todd and then Derek next, okay. You want me to jump in and happy to- uh, Yes, please Todd, yes, thank you. Well, all right, uh, Gail, we've certainly come a long way, uh, but let me begin uh, in the fall of 2012. I remember seeing a job posting for a lawyer position with the Gaming Commission. And I recall wondering whether that was something I really wanted to get myself involved with. Uh, it was clear even then that the road to the promised land would be paved with many challenging moments. But I was fortunate to be invited in for an interview and there I met with Jim McHugh and Gail Cameron. Uh, they shared with me that day their vision uh, for the future of the organization and I shared mine. Uh, by the time I left that interview, I knew that I was in if they would have me. Um, I knew that if people of the caliber of Jim and Gail were willing to take, take the leap, then so was I. The rest is history, and I'll always be grateful, Gail, that you welcomed me in uh, to share this journey with you. To be certain, the road has not always been a straight one, but through it all, I always knew that when the chips were down and everything was on the line, that with Gail Cameron sitting up at the commission table, we were all gonna be okay. Gail, you're as smart and thoughtful as anyone I've ever had the pleasure of working with. You have an innate ability to always hone in on what's really important. And you're as great and conscientious a leader as anyone I've ever worked for. I've learned so much from you. There will always be a piece of you in my work. Um, since we all know that you're a huge basketball fan and I grew up in Boston in the 80s, I thought I'd draw an analogy between you and the legendary Larry Bird, if I may. Not only was he a great player and so clutch in the most important moments, but his true greatness was that he made everyone else on his team better players themselves. And that, in my opinion, Gail, is your greatest attribute and why you too are a legend. You make everyone else around you better. So thank you, my friend, for everything and congratulations on a job exceptionally well done. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, Eric I think shifted. There you go. Sorry about that. That's all right. Gail, I'll keep my comments short. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid I won't be able to meet you out tonight, even though I would very much appreciate that. I haven't had a good night like that since the last time we were all down in Jersey. Um, but I do want to thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to be at this great agency. And I truly believe this is a great agency and you and all the commissioners have created a great environment here. Uh, but what has stood out to me is your leadership um, and your willingness to always step up, whether it be, as someone pointed out earlier, horse racing, when it was truly a mystery at the outset. And I don't think anyone wanted to go near it. And you, you've embraced it and you've stuck with it. And I think we've become a great, um, a great agency at that too, you know, with uh, you and Alex and the whole team over there. Um, when you took on the acting chair role, when that was a very difficult uh, time period for us, uh, you stepped into that role and led through it. Um, the acting treasurer role, which no one really wanted to deal with, but you took it on. And now thank you, Nikisha, for following up on that as well. Um, it's always great to have people that want to be here. Um, your pinch hitting uh, when it came to employee issues early on, and we were having some struggles there. Um, 
the work you did to help with the MOU with the Mass State Police and all the local police departments. Um, being designated the commissioner for the opening of PPC and spending many late hours there, including pulling a former um, GM out of bed um, to listen to some of the issues that we had to, had to deal with. Um, and personally, you being willing to call me out um, with direct conversations when I may have been overlooking something obvious, we're not considering an alternative, alternative point of view. Um, so I appreciate that, just the direct conversations. I will miss being able to catch your eye during a public meeting um, and know exactly what you were thinking. And finally, I'm pleased that you are the last active commissioner that actually remembers me being in a green jumpsuit out at PPC. So um, I welcome um, you going on to your next endeavor. We will miss you, um, but you will always have your mark on this agency. Commissioner, I think we missed that picture of Derek in the green jumpsuit. The video, <laughs> we saw it on video and it's hilarious. <laughs> well, that didn't make today's archives, I don't know. Gail's commentary is the best part. He's putting on the suit. Look at him. <laughs> the suit. We'll have to dig that out. So, for an alumni event, right, Gail? Um, who else would like to speak? I'll go really briefly. Hi, Judy. Hi. Um, Commissioner Cameron, it has been such a treat um, and a little bit bittersweet, if I must say so, to come back and work with you again. Um, it's been such a treat. And I think a few people know that I love sports, but I suffer from tiny person syndrome. So I don't really get to play a lot of them that often and be successful. But I really do feel like Commissioner Cameron is an incredible coach and an incredible person. And I think about good coaches and they tell you how to do it. And great coaches show you how to do it. And I think the very best coaches like Commissioner Cameron do both, but they also encourage you to kind of embrace your own style and be successful. And I think that you've done just that in your tenure here. You've shown me that I don't have to choose between working hard and carrying myself with integrity and strength and smiling while I do it and choosing joy. Uh, you have influenced this office from the very first day to the very last day, you were the first woman and you are not the last. And now there are women throughout this organization in positions of leadership. And that is because of you. Absolutely, that's because of you. And I speak for more, more than just myself when I say that it has been an honor to play on your team as an intern and now as an attorney, and the pandemic makes me a little bit more emotional than I used to be. Um, but I just, I wanna say thank you. I refuse to say goodbye. I will say, I will see you later. Um, but I hope as you transition from coaching us and leading us that you will stay in touch and step off the floor and keep watching us as we work uh, and continue on. So thank you. What's that? Okay. My turn. Well, Commissioner Cameron, I'm just going to have you just pause for it. We'll take it all in for one more second. All right. Put, put me in, Coach. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, wow. I'm putting you in, but you know, um, these remarks all, I'm sure, are resonating with you, Gail. And uh, this is a, a chance for you to take your time and reflect. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I love to laugh with all of you, but you really, um, I thought I would get roasted and everybody was serious and uh, you, you actually are making me cry. So I'm going to, I'm going to lighten it up. And, uh, but I, but I, but I'm really, really grateful. Heartfelt remarks, starting with the chair and all the way. I just, you know, I didn't expect that. I'll be honest with you. I expected a couple of thank yous and we had a good time, but that was uh, really moving and um, much, much appreciated. There's a couple of things I did want to say to all of you, my MGC team. 
we all talked about coaching and teams. Um, but I think you all know, and you all, many of you commented on the fact that I do love teams. It's my earliest love, athletics, playing on teams, all the life lessons that I've gained from those experiences. And I transitioned into the New Jersey State Police and found a new team. And that was very challenging, but very rewarding. But I have to say, my MGC team is, is my favorite. It just is. Something about rolling up your sleeves and starting from scratch, it's, it's just been a, a unique and profound experience and one that I had no idea at the beginning that I would enjoy so much. I went on a 15 mile bike ride when I, when I um, was asked to apply for this position. And I said, God, do I wanna go to Boston and work full time? And, um, and I'm really glad I did it because I met all of you and I got to work with all of you and we got to build this agency together. So that means so much to me. Um, you know, we started off the early days. It was Steve Crosby and Jim McHugh, Bruce Stebbins, Enrique, and it was Janice and it was Jamie. And that's it. And we sat around, Janice got us some office space and we had to figure out what to do, right? We just had to figure it all out. And it was, you know, we all divvied up work. We talked about it and I did raise my hand and say, hey, um, racing was first because we had no staff. And they said, well, you're taking racing this summer. We had just started the commission. And I know Steve Crosby made calls and, you know, he was connected and they said, oh, no, you're taking it anyway. So I just said, just give it to me and we'll figure it out. Right. So I, I can't tell you how much I love that experience. We brought a consultant in. I said, I just have to figure out where the landmines are. And uh, we got a great uh, roadmap of how to regulate racing properly. And we followed the roadmap. Right. And I just I really want to thank Alex for so much. Being part of the old team that did things one way and then having to adjust to a new team when we're going to close a lab um, and, and do some other things that were really hard, um, that's not easy. And Alex not only embraced the change, she led the change. People say nice things about me with racing, but I need to say we're so lucky to have Dr. Lightbaum uh, as our leader. She's being recognized now, um, you know, with committee work, uh, international racing, uh, commissioners of racing, rather. Um, you know, we are a model agency when it comes to racing now. And that's, uh, that's something we all can be proud of, right? And that's not me saying that. That's the scorecard that, uh, that uh, Racing International puts out. And we're right there as a leader in the way we regulate. So that, that's really been a great experience. Um, you know, Steve Crosby was our big picture guy, right? But he really did care about di diversity and responsible gaming. Jim McHugh, his legal expertise, he was such a present and what a big, what, he was such a presence and what a big laugh he had. I, I enjoy laughing with him. Just really quickly, um, Commissioner Stebbins, uh, incredibly thoughtful, detail oriented. We were like polar opposites. I was the bull in the China closet and he was so thoughtful and really um, just a, Wonderful man, really, really appreciate what he brought to this commission. Enrique, we were like brother and sister. We fought, but we, uh, well, we loved each other and we really did um, talk an awful lot and try to figure things out. So just, just I think the, um, the team, they did a great job of uh, putting the five of us together and, um, and all of the, um, your early work, right? We brought in consultants. We looked at different regulatory models. We had to hire staff. We had to set up a licensing scheme. And at the same time, we were figuring out how to, uh, how to score, how to have a selection process, how to implement the law properly, right? So there's a lot going on. But you know, as I mentioned, we did care about certain big picture things, you know, the diversity, the transparency, uh, and, and making this agency a great place to work. Um, and, and that's, that's where we get into our commission, our new commissioners coming in, you know? Um, and, and I think one thing that hasn't changed, right? We have new people here. And one thing that hasn't changed is that commitment to, to really looking at the big picture. How do we do it well? I really want to um, commend our chair who came in and really thought about things like, um, you know, this working group. This, this, um, this equity, diversity, and inclusion group. I mean, we had done some things as a commission early on with 
holding our licensees accountable for diversity and trying to to get you know folks to use the a diverse group of vendors, right? Uh, building a life that worked with women in construction. There was some really important steps, but this new working group um, that the chair brought on board, her leadership is, is really taking this to a, a whole new level, right? It's 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 us and how we are. We look differently today because of this work. We just, today's meeting alone demonstrates all the work that's being done in this field. Um, I got a call from uh, former Chairman Crosby last night. It was a nice article in the Globe about some of the work that he's doing, frankly, when it comes to the work that was started at this commission now being taken out to businesses and scoring businesses and, and awarding contracts. Um, and he just, he made the comment to me that, geez, I just hope all the new commissioners are going to care about this issue. And I had to tell him about this working group and, and the chair's leadership here. And he had no idea. I said, this, this is not something that will be dropped. This commission cares deeply about this issue. And um, this is something that's taken on, um, you know, a, a bigger role than it ever was. So I really uh, commend you for that role and, and, and many other leadership pieces to just a fresh set of eyes to make our commission stronger. I really do appreciate that, uh, that dedication. Um, you know, Commissioner McDonald came in after, after uh, Judge McHugh and he, you know, he was a former judge and added some great uh, just values and, and leadership when it comes to some of the legal aspects. So I really appreciated that. Commissioner O'Brien shares my love of public safety, um, but also has a sharp lens. And uh, I'm grateful that you care about all the issues and, you know, leading up the Public Safety Committee, uh, the research, the crime reports, all of those things. And also you're just your thoughtful um, attention to detail and your legal prowess. You really do, again, it's that new lens, that lens of um, looking at things a little bit differently and not afraid to say, okay, you did it that way before, but guess what? I think this might be a better way. So I do uh, really appreciate that. And Commissioner Hill makes me smile every day. I don't know how to say that differently. Um, his enthusiasm, his eagerness to learn, and he appreciates all the hard work of the staff. He has seen it and he appreciates it. Um, and also his willingness to jump right in with horse racing and, and you know, understand it, uh, be enthusiastic about it. I think all the commissioners have embraced it, but Commissioner Hill is, is going to be in the weeds and I so much appreciate that. And by the way, you have to give him, get him to give you a tour of the state house. I'm so glad that we were able yeah. to do that. I was able to do that before I left. I've been here for 10 years. I've been to the state house a number of times, different meetings. I never had a tour like that. And I just loved it. So we were, we were lucky. Um, Director Wells, right? Mm -hmm. it just was a, yeah. it was a great, it was a great tour. Uh, really? Loretta was with us. It was just a great tour. So a lot going on. And our newest commissioner, um, Someone who I already admire because she has courage. And let me tell you why I think this. You know, she came to the MGC after an impressive legal career. And, um, and one of the things she said to me is I really had an interest in gaming. Um, she came in as a licensing chief and really learned that role and distinguished herself, but then had the courage to step up and say, you know what, I think I have more to offer. And the willingness to compete um, knowing there would probably be lots of qualified people who wanted to be a commissioner with us. But that willingness to compete, I admire. And we've had other staff members who have done the same thing. Um, Karen Wells has stepped up. She was in her zone, right? She loved um, the IEB. She, she really knew it inside now. It was her comfort level, but she raised her hand and said, okay, I'm willing to step up and now take on the, uh, the role as executive director. I really do admire folks who are willing to do that. And I challenge you all to do that in your careers, right? Just don't be afraid to step up and, and say, hey, I can do this and learn from others and just have your career be anything you want it to be. So um, one quick story, you know, you're right. I do like to tell stories, but um, I thought it was important to get out to the casinos because you know, the way we regulate, we understood it should be a partnership, right? We're not just going to force something on you and not listen. 
you may not always like our decisions, but we're going to listen and we need you to be a partner, right? Um, and so going out, to, for me, it was to say thank you. And I appreciated the partnership and, um, and having uh, Nikisha join me because for her, it was an opportunity to say, hello, I'm the newest commissioner. So we, we show up at Encore and we end up in a conference room and we start looking around the table and there's President Jenny Holiday. There's Executive Vice President General Counsel, um, Jackie Crumb, and there's Nikisha Skinner and me. And, I, and I, it just hit me, wow. Has the face of leadership changed in this gaming uh, chair? You pointed it out in this, in this 10 years, you know, as it started, I was the only woman commissioner and there were no one in the in, in casinos leading the way that were women and how things have changed. And we commented on it. You know, we, we talked about that. And it, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a different form of leadership. And it just struck me in that meeting that that's, that's how things have changed. So um, one of the things I, I, I just talked about all the commissioners and I very much appreciated everything I've learned from every single one of you, those who have gone. But the most important thing that I want to talk about is the staff, frankly. Um, I may have started with the commissioners, but I'm, I'm ending with the most important thing, which is everyone that works at this commission. That is so important to me. Um, you know, I've learned from every single one of you, we would not have accomplished a thing. And every commissioner knows this without the team we have in place, right? We, you know, we, are, we have ideas, we, we have to take tough votes sometimes, but we are so well prepared for any decision we make because of the staff that we that we built here at the commission. And that changes all the time. And I see the attention to detail now with new staff members coming on board, how important it is to every commissioner that we, we build this team the right way. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. Um, you know, in the early days, uh, it was a privilege to work for me before we had an IEB director uh, to work with Lieutenant Brian Connors and Lieutenant Kevin Condon. I was so proud of the Massachusetts State Police and the, the individuals they gave us because you have no credibility when you're brand new. You have to investigate these huge, you know, multi-million dollar companies and they were smart, they were savvy. Um, shortly after that, we hired Karen Wells to come in as the IEB director. And, and I don't know how many times, you know, I've attended conferences everywhere. I've received, um, you know, Gina Joyce is another example. I've received compliments about how we investigate, how we don't waste time, how we treat people professionally, um, how we ask such smart questions. And, um, you know, it just, it always made me proud to sit in, at a conference and hear things like that about our team. So um, it, it just, uh, and, it, and it goes on, right? Loretta, Captain Banks is there now. Uh, Bruce Band, we needed his expertise big time, right? When we started this, so we could, be technically, we, we understood what we needed to do. So IEB is in great shape and I've loved, um, I've loved working with that team over the years. We, we mentioned racing a little bit, um, you know, just again, I'm going back to the leadership of Dr. Ellis Lightbone. Just, it, it is amazing what we've done with, uh, and Derek even mentioned that we really do regulate racing properly. Hopefully Alex, you're right, thoroughbred track, let's see. It'd be nice. Um, Many others. I just mentioned Derek, Mark Vander Linden. That an international reputation for what we do with responsible gaming. And he's he's led those efforts and really is something that we can be proud of. Our research, you know, game sense, it's it's just cutting edge stuff. Um, play my way. We got a report on that today. It's being implemented again. Just really, really important stuff. Um, Jill Griffin and Elaine Driscoll early on were just tremendous as part of this organization. Katrina, how would we have gotten through uh, this whole COVID thing without your teams? I mean, we were ready, right? We were ready to, to, to handle remote work and there's so many other challenges. Joe D, you took over seamlessly. Todd, I can go on and on because I love to talk about all of you. I'd love to watch your work um, and I don't wanna forget people. So I, I'm just gonna, in general, talk about um, the fact that uh, everyone on this team cares about the mission. I'm proud of all of you. I've loved working with every one of you. Um, Jacqueline and Marianne, thank you. After, after Jamie left, you just filled in seamlessly. 
Uh, Marianne's another one, been with us a long time, stepped up, has a more challenging role now, amazing. Um, love to watch everyone grow. Crystal, you're, not, you're another example. You, you use the word today that you are a lowly program manager. And now look at the roles and, and, the, and the work that you do. Um, it just, you know, not afraid to say I can do more. I really do appreciate that. Um, we've all had a lot of laughs together. I laugh with you every single day. Uh, Judy, you're right there in front of me. You can play on my team any day. I love your enthusiasm, your can-do attitude. And uh, the chair is not going to like this today because she wasn't able to be in the office, but she made the best homemade chocolate chip cookies. And uh, we all got to share them. I'm sorry you weren't here to share with us, but uh, Judy, Judy brought in a whole group today, a whole bunch of cookies, and it just uh, it got us through on that 15-minute break. Can I join, can you bring one over around 5 p.m.? Oh, well, that's right, that's right, that would be great. Sneak, sneak one in for me, Judy, thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I've, I've spoken long enough. Um, I just, last thing is a big thank you and you all enriched my life tremendously. I had no idea 10 years ago that this would be the ride it has been. And uh, just a big thank you, thanks to everybody. Sign language, um, can, we learned that at the Oscars, right? I love that. That was really wonderful. Coda and Gloucester, right? So, um, well, Commissioner Cameron, I know that um, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to have these kinds of moments, particularly when it's literally on a public stage, but um, it's, it's really been fun to hear from everyone and to reflect, um, you know, some of the a lot of the stories we've heard and you've shared with us, and there's so many more, um, but the good news is that we are going to gather in a more informal setting, and, and I hope that uh, folks will have a chance to maybe roast you a little. Um, so um, I think I actually think I forgot to mention T Todd real, really quickly. I, you he's did, you one. did say Todd, but well, yeah, I just, I just, but you, know, you can expand one now. Who raised his hand and said, "You know, I have more to offer to this, to this commission." So, good, good work, great work. Thank you, and thanks to everyone for your kind remarks. I really do appreciate it. And Gail, you made it very clear. The entire team. You couldn't necessarily mention everyone, but I know you've um, always said that. So. Um, for that, I think if anyone wasn't mentioned, everybody knows everyone was included. Um, I think I will close up, Karen. Um, I know that at some point you want to formalize your remarks for Commissioner Cameron, and in 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 whatever process you're planning on doing that, do you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Commissioner Cameron. We've got a, we've got a little plan here. I got to speak with her. Yeah, there's always an there's always a little plan going on, right? <laughs> yeah. um, there's always a little plan. So, uh, Commissioner Cameron, um, ten years, it's an accomplishment. You had a remarkable first career, a remarkable second career here um, in this capacity. Um, in my my college community, we. Um, are, are quite close through social media and everybody's always asking about the next, the next act. Um, I had a dear friend today retired from Barclays as a, um, a long career at Barclays. And I thought of you and her and um, we talked just briefly about her next act. And like you, she's not sure, but she's going to spend a little bit more time at that Berkshire um, house and uh, got kind of used to it during um, COVID. Um, another one is literally climbing Mount Everest, you know, right now. He's heading up to base camp, following my sister-in-law, who's going to be a doctor at base camp. And that was her second act to become a doctor. You've had an unexpected second act here. We look forward to your third, fourth, fifth act, whatever it is. Um, what we know from today's remarks and everybody's sentiments um, including those who are not speaking, but we all know so many stakeholders who have um, been the beneficiary of your work here who expect no less. So uh, for me, again, um, my best wishes on whatever the next act is. And if it's getting 
what was it 400 holes in one that you could get or is in a game what is it what is the match um i wish that for you um all right everybody can breathe carrie you're looking emotional <laughs> um i think um commissioner cameron unfortunately your job isn't done all this um we're going to bring to um probably if we have um if we move an another session this afternoon we are running a little bit long um todd i assume that um and k would will be ready for us but before we even move to that um i think we uh this is on executive sessions that we've anticipated it makes sense for me to go through this process now commissioners and then if we decide to go to the executive session, have a lunch break, and then go to okay, everyone, you know, knows that that process. Uh, Nikisha, you're coming in during COVID was hard. It's hard for me every time I do this to think about this process because I literally have to put myself into one room, physically room, and then walk up the stairs to the McHugh where we normally conference room where we would normally do executive sessions. I'm looking forward to that with you. Um, but right now it's still virtual. So um, Commissioner Cameron, <clears throat> we will have um, hopefully uh, the opportunity to continue to work with you right now on March 31st. Commission anticipates, and I, I do have to read this into the record, that it will meet an executive session in accordance with a GL chapter 30A section 21A3 to review the status of and discuss strategy with respect to city of Revere <clears throat> and Mohegan Sun, Massachusetts LLC versus Massachusetts Gaming Commission. As discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. <clears throat> In order to move forward on that, we do have to have a, a motion and a vote. Commissioner O'Brien. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, I move we go into executive session for the reasons just stated. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. I'm assuming that if there's any question, people will raise their hand just because I know we're hungry. Um, the next is that the commission anticipates it will meet an executive session in accordance with GL chapter 30A, section 21A3 to review the status of and discuss strategy with respect to FBT Everett Realty LLC versus MGC versus WinMass LLC. This discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the commission. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move we go into executive session for the reasons just stated. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. And Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. Thank you. Commission anticipates it will meet in executive session for purposes of reviewing and approving draft minutes of previously held executive sessions as conducting such review in public would contravene the intended purpose of convening the executive sessions. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we go into executive session for uh, the purposes just delineated relative to executive session minutes. Thank you. Second. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. Okay, so um, a very, um, I hope that uh, our tribute is, is recognized publicly, Commissioner Cameron. We um, again extend our appreciation. I'm looking forward to joining everyone this, uh, this evening for a little bit of an informal gathering. So thank you. And thank you to Karen and Marianne's leadership here and, and Tom and Dave. So thank you so much. Um, now, um, we'll, we will um, actually 
not adjourn this meeting, Todd Wright, and I'm going to leave this meeting. We will then um, reconvene. Should we do a half an hour, straight half an hour, 30 minutes for lunch? That gets us to, a, what, 225? We're going to, um, and then we'll go into the other virtual room and all of us will have that invite in our boxes. So it's a different room altogether. Make sense? All right, thank you. And thank you to the entire team uh, for joining us today and for all your good work. It was a very interesting meeting and a, a lovely trip. Thank Madam you. Chair, maybe to make clear that we're not reconvening the public oh, meeting. Oh, you know, thank you. I, I think I have to read that into the record, correct? Um, yeah, so we will not, thank you, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, that attention yeah. to detail, right? Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Um, and the memory is fabulous. Um, so thank you. Um, we will not reconvene this meeting in public. We will be going into these executive sessions and adjourn from, directly from those executive sessions. So again, to the public, thank you too for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.